Oakland, California, this is Revolution. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another wonderful episode. This episode right here, uh, lately I've been like trying to have a lot of people on the show, on the live stream show. I try to uh, cut it up a little bit. Uh, on Saturday, we are doing what we call the free show. Um, the free show is we just go. We, we have a big panel on Saturday. The panel now... Uh, I feel comfortable saying this is the panel cemented in. It is myself, my normal co-host on live streams, uh, Pascal Robert, Marcus from the Left Flank Vets, and Paul Prescott from Jacobin. So you get uh, not only an array of black thought, you get an array of black people. Uh, And we were blessed to have... Green Party Vice Presidential Candidate Angela Walker on the show. Uh, She was on the show back when it was only an audio-only podcast. I think it's episode, if not 50, it's episode like 49. Um, I think it's episode 50. I'm not sure off the top of my head. But it's an older episode. It's back when I was uh, doing it in studio, when I I was at my studio in West Oakland. Um, back when I was doing it, some crazy hours of the, of the day and night. But it's one of the more powerful episodes that people still hit me up to this day about that uh, follow Angela, that are Green Party followers of Angela, that, that try to find wherever she's at, right? You know, all these appearances that she makes. Because she's such a great uh, public speaker. She <coughs> speaks from the heart like we don't hear people speak from politically. I think the only other person you maybe compare her to was like a Nina Turner and I really think Angela understands power and the power that we have to take uh, if we want to have a real strong left the positions we need to be in um, if we want to have a real strong left and I, I saw my, my mother today and you know if you guys watch the live stream then you know my mom appears in the chat. If you're a longtime listener of this show, you actually know on Mother's Day, I do a show by my mom, which I, I'd probably be re-airing the, the Mother's Day episode. Uh, but um, my mom is, is giving me critique, right? She's always got something to say about what I'm not doing, faces I'm making, nervous laughter she doesn't like for me, outfit she doesn't like for me. She's just... just it's too much, right? Um, but on the, on another hand, it's actually pretty cool that your mom watches what you do. Um, and so she's like, I love Angela Walker. And, and you should, she should run for office. And if she doesn't want to run for office again, let her run for, for like local office. Tell her to move here. She's, she's a great organizer. Like I said, great public speaker. Um, I think you guys are going to really enjoy what you hear from Angela. Um, Hopefully what you hear from the entire panel. We did get into it um, with uh, a a friend of show, uh, a frequent viewer that that we had some disagreements with. But what what I do enjoy about this show is, first of all, we're not about like just cutting people off for certain disagreements, you know, you know, we have to get the trolls out of the chat. And this person was not, I repeat, was not trolling. Um, But we can have a healthy conversation. And when people are passionate about things, it's going to get slightly heated. So in here, some of the conversation is going to get a little little heated. Um, Other than that, I'm just going to try to move out of the way. If you are not a subscriber on the YouTube... Um, I finally figured out how to see how many people are checking the show out. I'm shocked at how many people are checking this audio podcast out. Um, but if you are not, there is links in the description to wherever you are, are listening to this, to the YouTube channel, youtube.com uh, slash This Is Revolution Podcast. Come watch the live stream Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday morning. Tuesday and Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 
Saturday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard, or sorry, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, way too early in the morning for me to be trying to be on, by the way. <laughs> but it's a good time. It's a lot of fun. We try to be as interactive as possible with the comments in the chat. Um, this is going to drop on Wednesday. I'm recording this on Monday. So if the Saturday show, I'm actually really excited. Uh, Napoleon the Legend is coming on the Saturday show. Maybe one more guest. Not totally sure if we can get one more guest. And we're going to be talking uh, about hip-hop and, and of course, maybe the hip-hop and, and, and socialism and hip-hop and the economy. Um, but it's going to be a good show. Um, and also, if you want to go back into the archives, there's a, there's a really good episode uh, that I have with Napoleon the Legend from, from last year. Um, him and I have stayed in contact. We've become friends. I, I love his music, and I definitely love his appearances on the Nomiki Konst show. Um, and there's also talk of doing another music episode uh, with Joshua Con Russell. Ever since I, I was on Jacobin uh, doing something about music and socialism, people want me on their shows recently on Kenzo Shibata's show, and, and we definitely talked about music. And people want to, you know, I called grunge out, and I don't, I don't really look at grunge as a genre. I think it was a made-up term, as most genre terms are by the media. But grunge to me definitely is one of those terms where. It's not a genre of music as much as it's a media term, and it, and it kind of, to me, is more of a fashion statement than it is a genre of music. That being said, I'm going to move out of the way. This is our episode, uh, our free show episode with Angela Walker. It's about three hours long, so this is wonderful for the long drive, for the work day. I will move out of the way so you can enjoy. This is Revolution, and I... I've been an activist for 25 years of my life. I come from a very long line of strong women. They always encourage me to use every single resource to help another young woman who's on her journey. I am sure black women will lead this nation to a better place. We're taking control and we're shaping our stories. All right, all right. Happy Saturday, everybody. We were not here last week, and we're back. We got a full house. I'm just going to get right into it before we even talk about that clip. First of all, coming all the way live from Miami, Florida, you know him as the writer for Black Agenda Report. We just know him as Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings, everyone. All right, that connection is fire. And coming from back east, he's a good man. Unfortunately, he just happens to be an Ohio State Buckeyes fan. Other than that, he's a great guy. He's Marcus from the left wing bets. What's up? What's up? What's up? Um, and yeah, I believe Scarlet Gray. I'm not. I'm not gonna shy away from that. There you go. You know, to the grave. To the grave. To the grave. You may know. This next man from the Joe the Postman episode of That's My Mama. <laughs> or you may just know him from Jacobin. He is Paul Prescott. Uh, Mr. Randy Watson. Mr. What's Randy going on? Watson. <laughs> we got Jacobin Schmiggers out here today. That's right. Make that a Saturday. boy good. That ah. boy good. And as Pascal said, we could not do this show without this woman. He literally said, because she didn't didn't get on right away. He goes, look, if she doesn't show up, we got to change the whole goddamn topic. Because I ain't talking about this shit without her. 
Her name is Angela Walker. She is a Green Party VP candidate. She is an organizer. She is someone I feel uh, honored to call my friend. Please welcome Angela Walker. Hey, y'all. I apologize. A thousand eight times no, it's fine. It's fine. For my just, dogs, man. My dogs. I panic. That's all. The <laughs> only thing is, is I panic and I forget that Saturday is the day all the black people come on. No, I got two dogs now. I just like one to two within like a week. And these, they like kids, man. They like kids. And yeah, so I apologize. All good. So that was a commercial that, uh, I'm, Paul, did you guys talk about it on Jacobin at all? Talk about what? Uh, Tamika Mallory in her uh, Cadillac commercial. With no, all we didn't. Shit. No. And somebody had the Ashe shirt with a dollar sign. Oh. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> did not talk about that uh did you guys get the I, I know i sent it super last minute and i apologize the hood communist actually wrote a really good uh, uh article on what was the title i put a quote of it on this uh, africans don't be a mammy for empire Ooh. Ooh. Mm. I tried to, I started reading it late last night. I'm like, this is a lot. I got to do this first thing, <laughs> first, first thing in the morning. <laughs> first thing in the morning. <laughs> I, I felt bad too, because I was like, oh, fuck, man. I'm sending this shit hella late to, to Paul and Marcus. Uh, I'm sorry. We got to get on some sort of like group chat or some shit, because I feel bad, because by the time I send y'all this shit, it's, it's hella late. Um, and I sent it to Angela. Hell, she's everybody I'm talking to right now is in the Eastern time zone. So I'm sorry when I send people shit like that. It's disturbing as shit. Hell, late. I've been working on this real fucked up music project. Uh, Angela, you saw the commercial. Do I have to show it again? No, don't show it again. It hurts your soul. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. First off, I just need to go ahead and say this and get it cleared up. Mm -hmm. It is such an honor to be here with all y'all. I have been listening to this podcast, like, and like, I'm just, I'm blown away that I'm actually in the room with y'all. So I just need to say that. Oh, wow. And yeah, I, I, I really am. Don't gas Pascal's head up anymore. Though. Oh, no, it's I'm... not. I mean, the, con the stuff y'all, I mean, y'all have been bringing absolute fire. So I just, like I told you, so I'm just, I'm blown away that I'm here. And yes, that, that commercial, while it hurts my spirit, you know, if people, other people need to see it again, absolutely. Did everybody, people respond in the chat, because I know people are coming in super, super last minute. Did you guys see this commercial? Because if I, not, I, I didn't see it. So, oh, shit. Yeah. Paul oh, hasn't seen it. Oh, we get... fuck. Show it for I the jacket. better Jackman. thing to do Jackman than show Jackman it again. Jackman. And right. well, it's just for the audience, if you're just like, I don't if you're really a standing watch TV desk, anymore. So, yeah, well, this is like, this is past, like past TV, and like, you know, this is something that we all got to put ourselves through. But if you are at a standing desk, please sit down. Like, this is just not safe. We don't want to get sued. But is this going to be like the Martin Luther King uh, Super Bowl? Oh, the, yeah. the, the that from commercial? like this, this from... I think is worse because at least with that okay. commercial, Martin Luther King had no idea what was going on, right? Yeah, he was dead already. Like he's been. Like, I mean that that could make it worse, but, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I think I think this is worse. I mean, because at least with MLK, who's actually the anniversary of his of his assassination is tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, it's it's to me it's more upsetting to see that commercial and be like that's not what that speech was about at all. Right. The drum major interesting speech. So here you go. I'm gonna shut up. I've been an activist for 25 years of my life. I come from a very long line of strong women. They always encourage me to use every single resource to help another young woman who's on her journey. I am sure black women will lead this nation to a better place. We're taking control and we're shaping our stories. You know, nothing says, oh shit, like when you use audacity of like Cadillac. Obama ruined audacity for everybody and the audacity of blackness woke capitalism like it's just all 
you want it all crammed down your throat in a nice 30 second mm-hmm. ad there you go but also i mean the audacity of that cadillac steering though just saying the revolution will be brought to you by leather bucket seats <laughs> <laughs> heated seats man Taking somebody said taking control and shaping our stories. Uh, you know what? Janice Graham says something I think is pretty right on. All activists misstep from time to time. And I remember Gerald Horn once said, I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, but he was like, it's hard to raise money when you work in this activist world. And when all of a sudden cats are giving you bags of cash, a lot of people's uh, ethics can be compromised for certain prices so it's easy to say not me but i've never seen a bag as large as the bag she took that's a big ass bag yeah that but bag that, that, a lot of people i mean listen man there's a lot to dissect here <laughs> <laughs> hey, og og janice graham is talking look look pascal janice somebody is might give you the bag Bro. Listen, I love Janice Graham, Janice Graham, but Janice Graham is the, I love all the black people, black women, you know, and, you know, she's about the peace in the community and the black united front against racism. And I respect Janice. I love Janice. But, you know, sometimes you just got to call out the BS, man. I mean, come we all, man. <laughs> well, I've, 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 I'm very curious because, you know, I mean, I hear I hear some of y'all talk way entirely too much. And I am very, very curious as to, um, Angela, have you experienced maybe, you know, so- something like this in your past of when someone has come and said like, hey, you know, we need to reach this community to make sure that they know that these payday loans are going to work for them, you know, or something like that. <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah, I can honestly say I have not. Nobody was that bold with me because, you know, the work that I did in Milwaukee, the organizing that I did, I think, you know, people understood that if you're having those discussions, you ain't going to be having them with me because it's going to be, it's going to get ugly. Um, I've always been pretty upfront about the, about what my politics are, that I am unapologetically socialist um y'all can keep that capitalist shit it's why i left a very decent paying job with really good benefits with the nonprofit industrial complex because um it's in you know it's some things you just can't do and you're watching it's like like rebel diaz said the four foundation ain't gonna fund liberation so yeah i i didn't have anyone come to me and like yo you know we need to they knew better. And if I could get you to maybe try to spill some tea, have you worked with any groups, any people that you're like, <laughs> damn, they sold out, saw that one coming. <laughs> Trying to get you to name names. <laughs> that's, that's fucked up, <laughs> we, What do they name sound like? Uh, uh, Amy <laughs> Footman? <laughs> <laughs> We're only like seven minutes into the show. Yeah. How Rhymes can I with? be as no. diplomatic as possible with it? I won't say that they that there were groups that took money from particular like individual industries or businesses. What they did do, what they are, is funded by the Democratic Party, which is, of course, mm-hmm. taking money from all of them. Yeah. So when you are trying to accomplish certain things, you're stop possum. You're on mm-hmm. my dog. You're on a leash, literally, because um, of who's funding you and yeah. all of these efforts that you are working for and pushing for, which is ultimately what made me really sick to my soul. And I know that sounds, high, sounds hyperbolic, but it really did. I got really depressed. Um, all these things that you're doing, you're funneling all of this energy, all of this belief, all of this passion to the, you know, I'm gonna just say it, Miss Pamela Davis, I know you watch this show. Leave me out. My cousin, I so I ain't trying to be cussing in front of your mama, Jason, but the goddamn Democratic Party. You taking all of that energy and funneling, funneling it to these do-nothing ass motherfuckers. Hmm. So yeah. Um, it wasn't individual industries like yo, this or that. 
is the granddaddy of all of them that's that's funding the nonprofit, you know, was funding the nonprofit that I work for. Well, I would like to interject because the, our sister Angela said something very interesting here. She's saying that the Ford Foundation will not finance our liberation. And I think that what we have to do is put a lot of this in context. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the classic piece of uh, 1960s uh, Black radical literature, Black Awakening in Capitalist America by Robert Allen, which is a very, very good book. If you haven't read it, I suggest you do. But in the book, and this is in 1969, it's written, Robert Allen basically talks about the fact that the Ford Foundation was already in 1969 trying to finance black power as a yep. means to neutralize its effectiveness and to basically co-opt it. If you haven't read, it's a really good book. I believe the author's name is Karen Ferguson. It's called Top Down. And it mm -hmm. talks about how the Ford Foundation under uh, George McBundy was, McGeorge McBundy was actually financing black power efforts and black nationalist efforts it, up and through the 70s. So there is a history of the foundation world and American capitalism using largesse and philanthropy to neutralize black political activity. And I mean, there is a history of phil philanthropy meshing with black society to neutralize autonomy of black people. This goes back to the, the development of historically black colleges and universities in the 19th century. There's a really good book called uh, The Education of Blacks in the South. I mean, we have to understand, E. Franklin Frazier made a very, very good statement that the, the, the role of philanthropies or nonprofits or foundations in social engineering black America is one of the most underappreciated aspects of how the American ruling class tailors black political expectations in a way to fit their particular needs. So as much as we may joke about this commercial and Cadillac is obviously not as sophisticated maybe as the Ford Foundation, this is a, this is a to me, what's disappointing about this, it, it illustrates a level of crassness that I think is unseen before in black political history. I mean, of all cars, you go to front for a Cadillac. I mean, how stereotypical it was like, a, you know, niggas love their Cadillacs. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's absurd, man. I mean, come on, and, man. And I think what you wanted a cap for. <laughs> I think the other, the other side of this is that certain work and certain organizations lend themselves more to this kind of uh, co-optation. And I always think back to over the summer where you had corporations like Amazon and Walmart giving, what was it, $100 million, $200 million to so-called social justice organizations. And I think, you know, we did a segment on this on the Jack and Show, and I brought up, you know, notice how they would never, ever funnel that money towards, you know, like uh, workers at Walmart who've been fighting for $15 an hour and a union. You know what I mean? Like they would never use that money to actually go towards workers' demands. It probably costs a lot less than what, you know, they're putting up for these so-called social justice organizations. But I think, you know, what we, I think, have to contend with, even going back to Black Power, you know, it, it was a slogan that allowed many people to fill in what it means, you know, and, and that took many different forms. And some of that forms was stuff that really aligned with what the Ford Foundation wanted to do. And I think you can make a similar analogy today with Black Lives Matter. You know, so many different people with different agendas are filling in that slogan. And we're seeing a lot of it seems very compatible with what the corporate world or what the nonprofit world will like. And I think notice, and I know I'm going to be, I'm boring because I always bring it back to this, but, you know, notice how in the 60s, they weren't able to do that same level of co-optation with the trade union movement. And same thing today. Again, you're never going to see Walmart put that money towards uh, you know, getting workers a union or their demand yeah. of 15 an hour. And so I think certain work kind of lends itself to this co-optation and we shouldn't necessarily be so surprised. I think that's just kind of like, they, they're they always going to play the identity politics and, you know, something I got to say, it's, I was like thinking about like, at what point in time, how, how like how long until, you know, you know, you're selling Listerine bottles with Kente, you know, Kente cloth print <laughs> on it. 
you know um that happens because in february duh <laughs> but that, i have well that's what it's like honestly i saw one i saw one that was like the the, the pride flag you know i saw like listerine bottles like listerine something i was like Man, I haven't seen a Listerine bottle with not one black power fist, not one Kente cloth, you know. So, um, no, yeah, Listerine you know, like, is what, for the movement. Listerine, what are we, what are we not doing on, you know, in the black power movement that we can't get the, get real representation on products, you well, know? You, you know, this is this is something that we talk about a lot. Is that is this representation, right? And and there was a there's a new documentary out, and I want to say it's on PBS and. It chronicles the lives of black trailblazers, right? And it's um, Diane Care. Of course, they're all in entertainment. Diane you're not going Carroll. Back to your Adam Curtis shit, are you? No, no, no. It's right. just a PBS documentary. <laughs> Adam Curtis actually works for the BBC, so you can eat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, Diane Carroll. Uh, it's Nina Simone. Um, uh, what's Foxy Brown's? Or Pam Greer. Um, who's the lady Pascal? She used to be a jazz singer, and then she became an activist, and she married Max Roach. Oh, um, you know who I'm talking about, right? These young people have no idea who we're talking about. Lena oh, Horn was in it. it. No, Nick, young passed a long time ago for you. When every song you like is a throwback, you no longer young. <laughs> That's how I feel. When every when every, when that songs I like is on the classic rock, I'm Abby like Lincoln. classic rock. I mean, Abby, I mean when he went to school with Nina Simone, like Pascal, you know. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was that was my only one for today. My only one. I swear, I swear. My only I'm one. I'm standing for... in solidarity with you, Pascal. I'm 47 <laughs> years old. I have like a bunch right, of grandkids, so I'm here with you. And Abby, Abby, Abby Lincoln, and she was actually an interesting case because she actually kind of like left Hollywood and went on to do a, a really interesting independent film and actually got into the activist world. Uh, Lena Horne had actually talked a lot about her relationship with Paul Robeson and Paul Robeson being a communist. It didn't shy away from that. But then the documentary made kind of a, a fat turn to um, the trails these women blaze and the activism they did was in just representation on screen. And that was it. And that's still where the Democratic Party is uh, today that we always talk about, right? And and I'm interested to see kind of where, where this goes because, you know, Biden, of course, has made a huge deal out of like the first of everything, you know, the cabinet, yeah. first black this, first woman that. And the thing about first is that there's only one first. And after a while, if that's all you're playing for, then the novelty is gonna gonna wear off soon. And also, I you know I feel like they act like there are so many people in this country who have lived black and white who have lived under a black political class for their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So you know it's almost like he thinks he's blowing people's minds by the fact that there's some <laughs> black people in the cabinet. Meanwhile, people have grown up their whole lives with their city council, mayor, state yeah. senator being black people. You know, I, I, at some point, this novelty they're they're going for is going to run out because again, there can only be one first, and after that, it's like, okay, well, now what? Well, there think, can oh, only be one, right? Exactly. I think for me, right, this the whole novelty of the uh, the uh, ethnic, racial, or sexual orientation or gender original, the first X Y Z, it's a class politics, even for black people, in that. The people that you will find who are most wedded to, oh, the first black this, that, whatever, comprador tool of empire, tend to be black people who are more class adjacent to be able to fulfill that job themselves. So we're usually talking about university trained, pedigreed, professional mm -hmm. black folk. Right. Or, you know, find a certain level of validation and vindication. That's why I wrote a piece called about uh, class and black politics in the age of Obama, talking about how one of the reasons why people like Obama, Susan Rice, Kamala Harris, are particularly important for a certain class of black people is because those people validate them and vindicate them. They validate them in terms of their presence in the overall usually racist white economic or job power structure that they're in, and they vindicate them in that they can show their white contemporaries, ha, look, we got one of us that's in control, see? I, you know, our people are doing it too. So it fulfills an almost kind of emotional 
kind of uh, sense of attachment that as long as this person is doing sorry, they did a very good sorry. job of kind of talking about this pathology is E. Franklin Frazier in the Black Bourgeoisie. That book very much talks about how the you know the need to grasp on to symbolic validation is a one of these kind of toxic predilections of the black middle class. But what I would like to say to Paul is I think working class black people aren't buying the hustle as much right. as they were in the past. But the question becomes how much of black political and social infrastructure is orchestrated or curated by middle class black people. Well, Churches. I want I want to show you guys this picture that uh the president has oh, tweeted yeah, yeah. out. Um, this is a cabinet that apparently looks like America. There's yep. uh, America's I'm, pretty old. Yeah, and like, well, the thing that, like, the one, the, the one that, the one that looks like us, you know, like, you know, the, you know, the, the, or at least the two, this one that's supposed to represent me, uh, the black, black male veteran. I've never been on the board of Raytheon. Oh, this guy, right? The, the Secretary of Defense, right behind Kamala. Right. Yeah, I mean, Marcus, Kamala. have you tried? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, like, have you given them a call? Have you sent your resume? I mean, when you got me, you got me. You, you got to make your own success, Marcus. Yeah, man. Like, oh, you like, got me slipping. You got me slipping are, on trying to get very, through. These are very wealthy people, right? Nobody in here is broke. Working class. Uh, Kamala Harris represents what. Everything that happens with an ethnic group, they always say that she's the first of that ethnic group to represent said ethnic group in the White House. Like when the Asian violence was happening, it was like the first Asian American president. I was like, what? First black vice president, female, Nigerian. <laughs> Poor Kamala Harris is everything. Who is that? And well, and that's what like, I mean, right here. Can you guys see me pointing at this or no? Oh, I have to point at it over here. Sorry. Who is the? Can you see this now? Can you see me point now? Yeah. Oh, I don't who know who's that? that. I don't know who that is. And who is this? We are so bad with who these people are in office. First of all, they're all wearing masks. How are you? Right, right. right. And this, yeah. the photo is kind of far away, so you know. Like, I, don't know. Like, so I only know. I only know Lord Austin because there's only one six eight black motherfucker that they got in that. You know. So is he that tall? He's big. Wow. He's, he's he just huge. took that job. I um, recognize I recognize Janet Yellen. But I mean, first of all, Janet I think Yellen, good call. All of us here with testosterone need to be more quiet and let Sister Angela talk about the subject matter of the day, which is about black girl magic for empire. And and I would like to ask her quite do you do you believe that there is a cynical manipulation of uh black woman aspirationalism by the liberal or the ruling class to to utilize it to perpetuate you know the worst of american empire oh god yes and the article that um hood communist shared i i have the honor of being facebook friends with the author of that oh, i don't no. want to Yes, I don't want to butcher her name. Uh, Onye Sanu, I think it's Onye Sanu Ch Chatoye, I think it is. Um, she's amazing. And so just thinking about, there's absolutely this perversion. And I can, you know, I listened to a podcast called Tea with Queen and Jay, and they went in on this. Um, <laughs> this, this, this concept of the perversion of what Black girl magic is you know, as long as you're serving empire, as long as you're serving capitalism, then it's, it's all of these things. That's not, that's not what this is about. It's like that, that meme that used to circulate that I don't think that word means what you think it means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this ain't, this ain't that. I mean, and you know, that, that article was a breath of fresh air that, you know, and if, if folks who are in the chat, you know, folks who are watching have not read the Hood Communist piece, trust me, y'all want to, because she is exactly now. right. This thing about Black women, like even referenced in that cringe commercial that we just watched, Black women are going to lead and save this empire. Y'all, that's not <laughs> our job. <laughs> that's not our job. That is not our function. And it is just another, 
iteration of what is referenced in the hood communist piece is mewling and it's insulting and it reduces the function of black women again to the same tropes that we've been reduced to the entire history of this country we're here to serve we're here to save we're here to we're here to offer absolution we're here to we're here to um to serve in the way that this this that empire demands of us, that capitalism demands of us. We're not, we're a monolith that this is what we do. And we're not folks who have a problem with what it is we are living under or that we have some sort of deep analysis and problem with it. Now, um, kind of carrying on from that is like, there is a certain passive language that happens in our society specifically the united states and like that ties that like what we're talking about that black girl magic but that basically that expectation that certain black women if they are in leadership or something like that um are supposed to be this sassy ass queen that's supposed to save us right um now i guess like i mean my question is uh how do you, and especially as you're coming off like running a campaign um, as a vice presidential candidate from the Green Party, that's something that you have to see like minute by minute, hour by hour as you're actually engaging with people around, you know, like, I guess my question, how do you dispel that black girl magic myth with people, um, yeah, that you just carrying on within your day-to-day life be authentic be your authentic self i'm not a trope i'm not an idea i'm not a concept i'm a person and that i I think about that a lot you know running for office and i by the way marcus i listened to that episode (laughs) where y'all talked about our run (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they were like, yo, I need everybody to vote for Biden. And I was like, you know what? I'm not mad at y'all. And I was, I said, when I, I meet him, I'm going to tell him that. I'm not mad at you because I understood where you were. <laughs> Angela, I don't know if I said those exact words. Who... Angela, can I say this? Can I say yes, this you in did. Marcus's defense? Yes, you if did. I need Mar- to see, Marcus wanted to see you, but he didn't expect <laughs> it to come back on him. All over his head. Angela, can I say this in defense of Marcus? I will say this in defense of Marcus. Ever since I told him, ever since I met him and told him that I talked to you, he has only said good shit about you. I'm being totally oh, honest. To Pascal, am I lying? Uh, no, you're being honest. You're being honest. <laughs> well, so <laughs> that's like... Pause there. <laughs> well, if we're going to talk about, like, if we're going to talk about politics and the Green Party, that's a conversation that's separate of the great miss angela walker right and so that's that's something that hey yeah like this isn't this is not the topic of the day but i hope we have something we we got another show then uh in in the background um he's been wanting uh, to talk to you angela for a while because he thinks you are the good thing out of the green party i'm not just saying this because your ass is here i'm saying this because when i said angela's coming on he was like angela's coming on yeah. Oh, well, and I, also too is like I don't want to do this thing because like now we're getting into the black girl magic. Like I might want to make sure that we're not doing that, right? You know, it's just like seeing who exactly who you are, what you have done, the work you've you've done for people, and and how how strictly you stick to your principles, right? Because it's not necessarily about like the person that's like, oh hey, whatever, right? It's the principles that these people exude, and can they actually foster a society? that 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 is prevalent for like that's actually you know good to fix people's material conditions and um yeah that's where you know i i recognize something special in the work that you've done with in your life and um uh, yeah so i'll shut up now so he, yeah i i have to i have to defend him on that on that side i will defend him that he's he's your your biggest political fan no i was teasing I just said, you know, because I had listened to it. I was like, when I meet this cat, I'm going to just let you know that I heard that. It was not an indictment of anything you said or did. Trust and believe. And it was, it's all love. I promise you. 
Excuse me, um, but all the, all the gentlemen with testosterone on the panel, we're already hearing comments from our, our chat room. Can we hear more from Angela, guys? I think that we need to really kind of learn to defer to the sister here because look, she's here to speak about. Hey, Earth. what happened to Pascal Robert? Because all I hear is Trey from Boys in the Hood. <laughs> oh, fuck, <laughs> man. <laughs> No, it's fine. I I did that, so I I um I did that, and um. Well, I want to actually because Marcus said something interesting because he used a trope, and I don't think it's the right trope. He said that it's the sapphire yes queen. I don't think they want the sapphire yes queen. In fact, I would I would be happier if they wanted the sapphire yes queen because sa- yeah, sapphire might smack him in the face. I think they <laughs> want the most. The worst trope, which is the mammy. They want mammy, the woman who can suckle them and, you know, it'll be all right now. Everything will be okay. And who will put aside her own personal family, emotional development to nurture, you know, the the, the dominant society, their family, their infrastructure. You know, I, I would actually be more comfortable if they were trying to uh, uh, embody the sapphire imagery with this black girl magic. The thing that I find more frustrating is I think they're actually trying to uh, encourage the kind of mammy-esque kind of like, you know, like I, when I hear the whole like black women will save America, it's like, I see this like, they this massive black female bosom, the suckling the, the nation state and giving it all of its life. You know, I'd like to hear Angela's thoughts on that. I actually want to say that it's, a, I think it's a mixture of both. I think that they want the sassiness, you know, that, and we see it in all of these, like there's a lot of contemporary movies where you've got this sassy black best friend that, you know, is counter to whoever they're playing against. I, white girl. Yeah. I think they want, they want that, hint of sassiness as long as it is not working against them um as long as we are sassy and downing our own people and shaking our fingers at our own people and reprimanding our own people for not doing enough or not being financially Mm -hmm. literate enough or not being upwardly mobile enough then that's fine when we turn that shit back on white supremacy and turn that shit back on capitalism is when they're going to have a problem Mm -hmm. with it that's Mm -hmm. not the sapphire they want and also when I'm thinking of the, the mammy trope, I think of two different, there's two different things that work there for me. While, you know, one is the one that you just discussed, absolutely, Pascal. But also, I'm also thinking of the fact that, and we don't discuss this enough, there, the fact of women who worked in these roles in the houses were not always nurturers. A lot of the people, you know, the cases where, where women were hanged, enslaved women were hanged because they fed the family ground glass, those are mammies too. So I wanna, you know, I just wanna lift them up. Like it was, this was not all that. When we talking about the women who who served in, in the big house, a lot of those folks were disseminators of information because you know they talked around us like we were furniture and still do talked around us like we were furniture, didn't know what they was talking about. Those folks, those women disseminated information. Those women, you know, did subversive things as well. So I just want to make sure that we are, uh, that those women are present in this conversation. No, that's a great point too. Cause like, even in like remembering like everything's going to be whitewashed, you know, and like they will take our own history and try and turn even like every ounce that we can against us. So thank you. I got, I got, I got. Sister, Sister Angela said something that was so important, right? That I, we, we, I, we got to hit on this. The, the sapphire is used as the agent of the black community. Mm-hmm. I, I vividly have the image of the mayor of Atlanta. I believe her name is Keisha Lance Bottoms nice, during yeah. the rebellions during the summer, chastising black people, saying. Y'all out there trying to get brown liquor. Y'all don't know how to <laughs> that. Oh my. She did say that. Oh. And even, I mean, go Didn't back. Be brown? She said brown liquor. Y'all out here looking for brown liquor. 
I want to I want to shout out. We always shout out people that we know in the chat, and actually a, a really wonderful woman that I work with. She actually had came in to uh, run uh, one of the shelters that I worked at, and uh, I've never seen a woman get done dirty as bad as this woman. Uh, the way these people treated her. Uh, she's a comrade. Uh, sister sister kuwa so she's in the chat and she's enjoying what she's seeing so thank you for coming on and, and watching the show sister kuwa okay can i just uh, say that uh ahead, paul. with your red called... rag in the back i saw that red rag i see that red rag in the back paul you got no. your oh, oh. I worry about oh. my red rag paul the mulatto hey, hey, big oh. so everybody can see that shit in the back he wanted everyone to know you know what it is paul <laughs> so, so you people in the chat know you know <laughs> It's on the left uh, side too. Well, one thing I want to say, uh, Pascal's mammy impression just made my day. Uh, <laughs> so I got to shout out to Pascal for that. But also, I mean, to be more serious, you know, I think you saw this trope play out a lot uh, with Georgia. I mean, that was a narrative. Stacey mm -hmm. Abrams, black woman saved the country. They saved the Democratic Party. Even though if you actually dig deeper into the numbers, even just in Georgia, you'll find that uh, there was a lot of upper middle class white people that saved Biden. But um, that that's like a big narrative that you heard coming out of Georgia. And now and I think they're, you know, they're trying to like push Stacey Abrams into that role as, you know, the, the savior of the nation. Um, so I wanted to show you guys this. I said I was going to do this uh, on the bonus after hours feature for patrons. And one of our nice, wonderful, talented patrons made this image. I wanted to make it the thumbnail of the show because I was really going for controversy. I feel it's like controversy week in the, in the This Is Revolution slash Zero Books camp. Doug Lane with his fucking uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald video that everybody wanted to cancel him over and all this other shit. So let me see if I can share this image with you guys. Uh, I showed Marcus. Pascal told me that he would leave the show if I made it the thumbnail. So I did not, out of respect for my brother. But he did say I could show it during the show. So I want to show you guys the thumbnail. Uh, trigger warning. It's triggering. So hold on. I'm old. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Working on the tabs. <laughs> so can you guys see this? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Damn. <laughs> Look away. Hold on. That's Hold fucked on. up. For real. How long? How long? Everybody, I want can we go around and guess how long until this is actually issued? Oh god. <laughs> three years. I guess it's three years. I did not support this. He did not. He did not. The record. I was like, I was like, Pascal, I got the best image for the thumbnail. And he was like, Look, man, that shit's not cool, man. Oh. He goes, People gonna get mad at us. I was like, That's okay, because we're gonna talk about it. He's like, No, 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 we can't do this. And he was I think, calm. I mean, if there is no viable left alternative, I'd give it five to six years. <laughs> Thank you. See, like, this is what sucks. Is because they would try and do this. Because, but look at it this way: if someone two years ago would have shown me the Nancy Pelosi and the Kente Cloth <laughs> kneeling, I would have said yeah. no. You no thought way. it was a Boondock skit, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you thought no it was a way. Boondock skit, right? And look at that. So, I mean, I think anything's possible. That look, is there... a DNA level insult, right there. <laughs> this, this was kind of a joke we made when we were talking about actually getting ready to talk about this show and, and we had went long on our on our extra segment because talk about black women capping for empire you know let's put harriet tubman on the 20 dollar bill and shut you negroes up mm -hmm. and remember when that was part of the discussion during the trump administration and steve mnuchin was like we're not putting this negress on the 20 dollar bill and cats got mad about it right and we're biden, not isn't Jackson biden's up. biden seriously considering you know, putting putting her hair on, right? Maybe I don't know. In, Biden's in gonna put her on, and he might straighten her hair. In defense oh, of geez. Jason, Jason, <laughs> you, this image came up in reaction to the suggestion of putting Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar twenty dollar bill, and in the theme of today's show, 
we were saying, well, the logical extension of that playing up on the whole kind of exploit racial grievance was to create an uh, Amex, Amex card black with Harriet Tubman on it. Yeah. Eventually he actualized on the conversation and had it on the underground railroad to spending freedom <laughs> and in benefits. The secret, you know? I wanted to put it out into the universe and then the universe responded by saying, here's your cancellation papers. Yeah. But that's, I mean, something that like. Angela's shaking her head. (laughs) Because it's disgusting to think that that might be a thing. And when we have, you know, Jared Ball did a real good take on Killer Mike and his Greenwood Bank. I haven't watched that yet. I got to watch that. I got to watch that. Angela, go, Angela, go. I know, I know, I know uh, you and Jared are cool. Did you watch that show? Yes, I did. And yes, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, y'all want to. Y'all want it's, to. It's, it's, you know, Jared Ball has a really good analysis on the myth of the black. I think he wrote a whole book about it, right? Right. The myth yes. of black buying power. And he really called out where Greenwood Bank is getting their money from. He called out kind of the whole idea of that shit and Black Wall Street. Yes. Um, my feelings are still hurt, Jerry. This is, Ball. Well, and this is something though that like it's it's like I feel like in what we see in practice now is something worse. You know, whatever black power, black capital commanded or would command, it, it's it's like not even we're not even like basing shit off of that anymore. Now it is just sports athletes that and like I mean, like that are getting most of it because you could say, "Oh, hey, we're Deval Patrick." If if Black Capital was really um, powerful in any way, you know, like Duval Patrick would have kept going uh, a little bit further. But no, it's 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 all on just athletes who could be poor in in, in hours. Um, it's just and yeah, it's I, don't, just, I, I was well, just getting I mean, like this is all like the, especially the voting thing in Georgia. It's like people yeah. are counting on on corporations and moving some all-star game to do something when the answer should be no like right. get in the streets and and make sure people are in power aren't in power anymore and it's just amazing that on the one hand someone will could critique reagan and uh trickle down economics right but then some people that same person will then indulge in the fantasy that you know we have more black business owners somehow i'm going to see that money because <laughs> And I'm like, where is this fantasy coming from? Or, I mean, even worse, you know, you could say, at least if you have a business and community, you know, you will benefit from their tax revenue in different ways. But, you know, we want to give tax breaks to all the small businesses, especially small businesses owned by people of color. So then you're really not seeing that money in any way. And I'm just amazed that, you know, on the one hand, we can beat up on Reagan, but somehow when it comes to black businesses, we'll, we'll indulge in the fantasy of trickle down like you well, know, LeBron, LeBron, a lot of fantasy. Opening the Red Sox. Well, Paul, I'm not going to see a cent of that. The, you know, Killer gotta, Mike. Is a, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go we got to really analyze where the origins of the black capitalist right. mythology comes from, and its connection to black nationalist damage thesis. Right. thesis. The black nationalist damage thesis that black people have been broken by slavery and Jim Crow. And since they are broken, they must prove, or as I, I wrote, must redeem themselves and show white society that they can do for self. A lot of this isn't really based on real political economy. It's really based on an emotional belief mm-hmm. that certain a certain class of Black people have that Black people are damaged, fractured, shattered, and need to be remade and rebuilt. And what is profoundly saddening is that much of this this comes actually from Black political thought and certain certain segments, certain conservative segments of Black nationalism, not revolutionary nationalism, not other aspects of nationalism. But there is an element of Black nationalism that plays on the damaged thesis and the need to redeem ourselves as a part of the project and black capitalism fulfills that narrative. 
I mean, isn't that just a rehashing of the old? It's just a, a, another way that that or another manifestation of that old belief that um, we have to be good enough. You know, we've been emancipated. We have to show the white folks that we're good enough to be among them. We have right. we have to show them that we deserve to be here. We deserve rights. We deserve to not be murdered and run off our land. We deserve exactly a version of the meritocracy. Right. And, and it's something I think that we have or a certain class of us, which y'all have been really good in discussing, by the way, um, Danke. have been um, a certain class of black folks have been yeah. very invested in keeping that going. And, you know, for people who are just trying to, when we're thinking about cash poor and working class black folks, thinking about the fact that you're just trying to keep your head above water, you know, you're trying to live, you're not digging any deeper into that and saying, wait, 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 um, the people who are putting this stuff out also happen to be people who, you know, do pretty well under capitalism, do pretty right. well, you know, and, and they're, they're convincing us that, you know, have no problem convincing us that our, con our communities are inherently, inherently damaged, inherently irredeemable in some places. Right. So, yeah. And it's so paradoxical coming from, you know, when it's coming from the Black nationalist wing, because, you know, it's kind of draped in this militant rhetoric. But as Angela just said, like the substance of it is not militant in, in any sense, you know. Yeah, no, this is something that like I've had to kind of like reflect on myself and just even like what was what has been the role of like the black veteran and like at first in uh you know Frederick Douglass like convincing, hey, this is like this is how we fight for freedom and equality. Um, you know, going into World War II where black GIs the first time they felt any semblance of actual like equality was you know being deployed um and then having to come back home you know vietnam same type of thing um but uh yeah you know almost in its, in its entirety literally just capping for capitalism um you know and even like my dad he he got his he got his citizenship to, through army service you know so i don't know it's like this kind of this whole thing of like yeah no matter what if you even think in any way, if you're trying to self, uh, a grant, not even a self aggrandize, but just prove yourself to the system, you know, if you're playing by the system's rules, it's always going to end up at that. I remember watching an interview with Jim Brown recently on YouTube and I was, and he was talking about how he had a disagreement with Martin Luther King because he was saying that Martin Luther King believed in violence and he didn't believe in the violence. And he, and he, first of all, he assumed that Martin Luther King didn't believe that economics was the path to black liberation, which is one of the biggest lies about right. the civil rights movement that they didn't have an economic agenda. It's just a different Probably kind of people, economics, right? Yeah, it was, they had a profound economic agenda. But what happened is that the Johnson administration in the height of the Cold War would not implement it at that time for a variety of reasons. But he was saying, I believed in economic, you know, economics. And I said, when I looked at the Koreans, they didn't seem to have to talk about nonviolence. When I looked at the when I looked at the Chinese or I looked at the Jews, and this this again, another consistent trope about black nationalists, the which 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 was used during black power, the belief in ethnic pluralism. We can mm -hmm. be like the Irish, we could be like the Jews, we could be like the Italians, and we can develop our own economies and we can block and, and what this fails to realize is number one, the, the population density of America. Amer of black Americans compared to other ethnic groups is completely, totally different. And number two, the way in which black identity in America has been reduced to production in America up till the 20th century, they're cropping in domestic labor. And the way in which capitalism requires black identity to be rendered to the reserve army of surplus labor. If these people seem to believe that somehow the way in which capitalism interfaces with Asians, Chinese, Italian Americans, and Irish people is the same way in which it interfaces with Black people, which has never been the case. 
All right. Not to say that there aren't particularly distinguished, there aren't ways in which capitalism oppresses all workers, which is obviously the, tr the truth. But there is a particular nuance in, to, in the way in which American capitalism has extracted labor from African-American workers and disinvested them in integrating into the capitalist economy. And all of this discourse of like, we can be like the Irish, we can be like the Germans, we can be like the Asians. Is this forgets all of that, right? And something you know, Bayer Rustin used to say a lot, you know, talking about, well, what about the Irish? What about the Italians? He's saying, like, they didn't advance through self help either, they advance, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, they advance yeah. partly through the trade union movement, partly through benefiting from New Deal policies, things like public education. You know, I mean, like, they it's not like they advance through self help and entrepreneurship either, and so we shouldn't expect that black people could be that much different you know well that was a lot of that was also a lot of also jim brown wound up supporting trump right jim brown sucks one of the greatest football players yeah. of all time but as a, right am, am i wrong i mean talk about how he hated the march on washington right or he he like went to the white house right and supported trump in a way uh, yeah right. I, um, like we'll judge right. Yeah, I mean, Jim. Like, I, he, I, listen, I listen. I because a lot of people were like, "Oh, Pascal, you always hard on black, on black, black nationalism." Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, the moment I'm not a black nationalist. I am. I, I was at one time. Uh, uh, if you guys want to read a good book explaining the ideological origins of black nationalism, read "The Golden Age of Black Nationalism" by Wilson Jeremiah Moses, and his thesis is that it's not a revolutionary project. It's a fundamentally conservative reactionary project now there are types of black nationalism there's revolutionary nationalism the different type but the traditional kind of very conservative black nationalism has never been a revolutionary or radical project at all and that's why it's not surprising that you see so many and i saw this in trump's 2016 and 2020 election so many particularly black men who were black nationalists gravitating to trump And I mean, if you think about, but if you think about the rhetoric that people like Trump put out and how it would appeal to those segments, you think about the fact that these are folks who are very patriarchal, who are very, very homophobic, very transphobic, very misogynist in a lot of different ways. They align. So, I mean, yeah, Trump, is, you know, he, even and yeah, that's I mean, a whole I mean, other discussion in and of itself about the fact yeah. that he's a symptom and not the problem. But the you know it was it was disappointing but not surprising to see certain segments or certain certain types of black men aligning themselves with you know someone like him and 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 the rhetoric because that's the shit they agree with. You know, one of my issues with working with organizing with people <laughs> who were um, this is that was their mindset is, you know, I asked them in your black utopia, where is my heathen, queer, tattooed, pierced, heavy metal fan, <laughs> um, free thinking black ass going to fit in your black utopia because I'm not about to, you know, the way that you view women and, and women's roles in your, in the way that you're envisioning what things will look like after black liberation or during black liberation. I don't fit in any of that. So what the hell are you going to do with me? So that was, that was. A I thought you were talking about Jason for a second there. <laughs> Jason. Right, 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 like think. tattooed metal. <laughs> Queer. <laughs> no, I'm queer, but yeah. So it Take was just that. like, where am I gonna fit in y'all? This idea of your your black utopia, and is I've I've never gotten an answer to that. No, because they don't know where to put you. <laughs> They're like, there's a wing over oh, there. Oh, they do. Oh, trust me, they do. <laughs> well, no, and that's like yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going. Honest, yeah. Let's let's be honest. The honest is well, they know. no. They will probably try and put Angela back in her place. You know, where man, you know, like that's that's what you know, that's where that's where it is. And that's like I mean yeah, well, where it just let's talk about something controversial. At the same time that we have that reactionary component now, shit. There you go. That reactionary component among nationalists, 
What do we think about the liberal foundation world highlighting those nuanced types of black women and trying to use their alienation from certain segments of traditional black thought and catapult them as the face of black leadership for the future of um, Black Lives Matter. I mean, if you will, you know. Well, I, mean, I don't know if this is getting at what you were just saying, but I think it kind of comes back to like certain agendas allow them to do that. And, and in a way, it's like, I wouldn't even call it co-optation. I mean, if, if the agendas are kind of aligned, is it really co-optation? Um, and that's why I think the, you know, uh, foundation world was able to so successfully use certain elements of black power, because I think there actually was more alignment than, you know, some people would like to think. Mm. Um, so I don't, well, I don't know. Do you call that co-optation when the alignment is actually there mostly? I don't know. That's a damn good point. But that's a whole can of worms. <laughs> I mean, no, you know. it, it is, and it's and it's fucked up because people don't want to hear that shit. People want right. to think that some of these cats have like the most righteous fucking uh, intentions, and then something happens, and poverty strikes them, and they they take a bag, and it's like, no, this was kind of the plan all right. along. Or, and again, even sometimes the intentions can be fine, but it's like I'm sure there are plenty of capitalist small business owners that have great intentions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean. I'll go back to the line Adolf Reed always says about sincerity is an overrated trait. It's like, I'm sure most people are sincere, but uh, if you're doing a lot of harm, it, after a while, it doesn't really matter. Um, Pascal, Marcus, Paul, I think Paul's done some coverage of this. I just want to say on a side note, Paul has a video out on Jacobin right now about, uh, about uh, what's it called again? Union... Your new your new labor uh, video? Oh, about yeah. Nixon? About Nixon and the heart. That's a oh, really good thank video. You. How yeah. the right how the right courted the labor movement. Thank you, brother. How the right, right. yeah. Yeah, that, that was a really Nixon good Nixon was video. a smart motherfucker. And he also got James Brown on his side. So that and I smarter than it, Trump. <laughs> and I and I watched I've been falling down this rabbit hole of these one minute videos that Mike Judge does. And and if you don't know Mike Judge, he's a guy that did King of the Hill, Office Space, Ooh. et cetera, et cetera, Beavis and Butthead. And he has a series, it's an animated series called Tales from the Tour Bus, and, and it's about music genres that he is a fan of. And so he has a whole series on funk music and has these really actually good interviews with like Bootsy Collins and shit, like people that were actually with James Brown and his band talking about James Brown, the man, and of course their tour bus stories. So they're, a lot of them are... are, are gossipy stories but james brown is an interesting individual because he was just so self-centered because he, he had a horrible life growing up and sometimes james brown is almost like martin luther king where he's stuck in i'm black and i'm proud james brown and we forget like the james brown that endorsed richard nixon i remember uh bruce dixon told me that when james brown first put together that song Mm -hmm. That the Panthers actually get had to get at him because his original lyric was going to be "I'm black, but I'm proud." Oh, <laughs> hey, oh, oh, that would yeah, yeah, no. James Brown comes from a whole different uh, yeah, era. I'm just and, and like a whole perspective about about oh. power. I was talking about black people who can't be racist because they don't have. We don't talk about it, but people say because they don't have any power. James Brown not only owned the rights to his music james brown bought a pressing plant and radio stations so he could record a he re, and he bought recording studios actually to the end he had recording studios so he could record a song and he had two labels one for full albums and one for 45s so he could and he understood through little richard the power of payola and the power of radio so james brown was like why would i pay these punk ass radio djs to play my song when I can buy a radio station. So James Brown went, bought multiple radio stations in markets where there was tons of Negroes, bought record pressing plants and studios. All right, band, you, we're gonna record a song. I'm gonna fucking press it. Then I'm gonna ship it to my stations and break my music. 
that's power on a level that we right. only understand through the lens of Live Nation, only through the lens of Golden Voice. Right. Joanne is saying James Brown owned the means of production. Right. He owned the means. And you know what happened? Kissinger apparently said, no, I'm sorry, Spiro T. Agnew apparently said, any man that can stop a riot, because let's remember James Brown played after Martin Luther King died, and they were like, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna show this on PBS because we're afraid these niggas are going to burn down Boston like they've been doing all over the country. They actually, people actually come on stage and start fucking with James Brown, and he calms these motherfuckers down because he's still ghetto ass James Brown. And Spiro T. Agnew says, the, a man that can stop a riot can start a riot, mm -hmm. and they shut his black ass down. The people that he actually was capping for end up shutting him down because they're afraid of him. And his, uh, I don't know if this is the exact quote, but he was saying, like, you know, for him, black power is green power, mm -hmm. which going back to the Jim Brown thing about money. Now, theoretically, that could be a good thing if you're talking about, you know, unionizing most black workers. But of course, that's not what he was. Um, and yeah, and not to do shameless self-promotion, but I did a segment a while ago, I think it was on weekends on, you know, the limits of black capitalism and buying black where I covered about, yeah. you know, James Brown and uh, and also Jim Brown at the time. Um and Sammy Davis Jr., you know, endorsing oh, Nixon Sammy, and, no. uh, you know, all, all that kind of. But again, it's like, it, you know, to say, and this is the problem where it's like to say James Brown, you know, betrayed black people or something, it's kind of wrong because from James Brown's point of view as a capitalist, why not endorse Nixon? There was nothing contradictory from his mm -hmm. point of view. If you are a wealthy black person, if if Nixon's talking about lower taxes and blah, 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 and blah, blah. Nixon was all about black power, there's a clip that we played a while ago. I'll I'll try to find it where Nixon's like, oh, I love these black power Negroes. By right. the way, Janice Graham and she told me this before. She was at the concert where James Brown stopped the riot in Boston. She, former like, Black Panther, by the way. Like that, uh... James, like James Brown to me is an interesting figure because you have mm -hmm. this man that didn't appreciate like he wasn't he wasn't cooning right right he wouldn't like push negroes to the side to get next to to white boys or white people there's actually a, a story that his manager tells um or no i'm sorry the a writer tells that a, a black man a young black kid is doing an interview of james brown and a white hollywood producer barges in the room and james brown is so offended that this dude stopped his interview. Like, you don't see me talking to this young brother here giving an interview because the guy wanted, they, they wanted to make a movie about James Brown. And James Brown tells the Hollywood producer, there's no way in the world you can make a movie about me. There's no way in the world you can write a movie about me. He's like, I got to write the movie. I got to produce the movie and I got to direct the movie. If you want to make a movie about James Brown, now get the fuck out of here so I can finish this interview. Like, <laughs> hearing that shit it's funny like i said he's a comp he's a he's a complicated individual i don't think he's a, he's a a simple read like he's just a simple black capitalist but uh jason i just sent you the link to nixon on black power if you want to play it ah uh, i do i do say something profound while i cue it up uh let Paul, but let's Paul. You said some profound stuff, man. You know, uh, we, you know, we should let the the Shemigo from Philadelphia, who's a crip. You, I know he. That's blood. He's a bud. Pyru Paul. Right. Pyru Paul. Pyru Paul. Pi Paul. Pi Paul. Don't put it on. You don't know what kind of trouble you're gonna get. Yeah. Right, right, right. I know you don't hang out in the hood. The Philly niggas is no joke, Paul. Don't fuck around. With the you're I already, feel bad enough. See, I was you're already trying around. to get me in trouble with with Umar. With Umar so I felt. Hey, real talk, Paul. I felt real. The other day, I was like, you know what? I gotta stop doing Umar shit around Paul because them niggas might fuck him up. And he it was weird. I mean, there was a rock came through the window the other day. <laughs> I was like, "That's weird." No, I'm playing. Angel, I'm playing. <laughs> that I would feel so bad if one of Umar's people just fucking caught Paul out there in the streets. Yeah, you would laugh a little bit though. You gotta admit, you would laugh like it depends. A bit. It depends if you if you like if they just like talk some shit. I laugh. Right, right. They, like but... punch the shit out of you, and you didn't see it coming. I'd be upset. I oh, wouldn't be on the first thing smoking. I get to Philly eventually, but I would help you out. I love this clip because Nixon sounds like Louis Farrakhan. It's wonderful. 
seem to be shifting. Some aspects of black power are very disturbing to us because it means uh, revolution. It means violence. But other aspects of black power are very constructive because it means that black people, they want to stand on their own feet. Uh, they want to have black banks and not just go to white banks. They want to have black businesses and not just go to the white businesses. And they should have. And they will have. Now imagine James Brown, you know, hearing that. Of course he thinks that this dude is is uh, the right man for the job. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to play where I feel. Well, what James wanted. Brown doesn't know is that Richard is saying, of course we want these Negroes to go to black banks. You think we want them to go to Goldman Sachs and get into real capital and get real money? <laughs> <laughs> Let them scrap their Negro pennies together. Of course, yes. Also, everything that he talked about is not a threat to capitalism. That's right. all I could think right. about is like, right. of course I support what they're talking about. They, <laughs> He only lifted up two of the things that like the black power movement was actually discussing like the capital issue you wasn't talking about us owning the means of production for ourselves you were not talking about you know socializing housing socializing the, the things that we were asking for you didn't bring that up. you brought up they want their business they want their banks things that are not a direct threat to the capitalist system in this country so well, well, of course that's said, well, yeah Paul said about black power, which is very, 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 very spot on, is that it meant many different things to many different black people as well, not to just to you know different the ruling class, because what uh, what core and um, who was the brother who was president of core at that time? Uh, oh my McKissick? god, McKissick. No, not McKissick. Uh, it was um, the Caribbean Bonham. brother. He, he died recently. The guy who beat up Al Sharpton. Roy Ennis. Roy Innes. Uh, right, right. Yeah, what Roy Innes was talking about in terms of black power was not the same thing that Stokely Carmichael was talking about in terms of black power. And you know, I I wish I had I had the exact the, the exact um correct thing, but you know, one of the first black power conferences, it was I think in 67 in Newark, put together by Stokely Carmichael and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. I mean, you, you would be surprised to see some of the co-sponsors, including the New York Police Department and some other big, uh, I think it was some sort of oil company. Again, I don't have the exact figures. I did write something about it. I'll have to go back and look. But but again, when I saw that, and that, again, went back to like, well, I don't know if this is co-optation. This seemed like there was a lot of agenda aligned from the beginning. But I'm going to look, I'm actually going to look that up right now. Um oh. Yeah, and I think all like a lot of this kind of ties into football. the the dis disorganized nature of organizing against like what you don't want, and you know Stokely Carmichael even talked about right. this is that like that's not unity, right? You need to have a unity of goals or unity like where are we going in order to have true unity, and that's you know going back to Nixon and all these things like that, saying hey we don't like poor black people around us or we don't like poor black people is something that like a black nationalist could hear that sentence like, well, yeah, we don't want poor black people or we don't want us around you either. And there's really no unity in where are we going? And at that point, the, the people in power get to decide where we're going, right? You just only decided, Hey, that's what we don't like. And then in some cases we can be getting things worse. You know, when you talk about all the different sorts of, uh, bills and reforms and and all the fuck bullshit that comes along with just being in the united states um but no I, I, at the end of the day we have normalized uh a, a disorganized sense of unity that doesn't mm -hmm. you know doesn't really direct us in any way it just says we're we're leaving this one area and it literally mean you know everyone just walking in their own separate way i want to, to, to really touch on something paul said earlier which is a very good point about how the ruling class was very willing to coalesce around black power. This is a good book you guys should read. I just gave the link. Top Down, The Ford Foundation, Black Power, and the Reinvention of Racial Liber Liberalism, Politics and Culture in Modern America by Karen Ferguson. It's a great book, and it talks about how the American ruling class and its institutions were very happy to 
to coalesce around the aspirations of black power to basically engage in the concept that I talk about on the show all the time to render black politics into the politics of containment in that it's a means of social control under a collective black community in which its political aspirations can be negotiated through an elite tier and maintained in a contained fashion. Very now, good. yeah, I got a question for the person here who has uh, run outside of the you know elite political structure. Um, Angela, ha- I guess, yeah. Can you talk about maybe a little bit about what, you know, what motivated you to uh, run for a, you know, like a part of the Green Party uh, ticket, but also kind of the grander sense of things of like, I mean, where do you think the left can just grain some ground as, as yeah, as, as far as the organizing effort, the unifying effort? I think you just touched on it. What you just said about this kind of the way that we move in this, this space of going from what we don't want and not being super specific about what it is we do want. You're absolutely right. And one of the things about the platform that I ran on is it's everything I want. And it's very specifically what I want. I want socialism. I want socialized housing for all. I want Medicare for all as a community controlled national health service. I want the nationalization of our utilities. I want the internet to be publicly owned. I want an economic bill of rights for all people. I want a guaranteed income above poverty for all people that need it. So um, just talking about, you know, and it was really funny because when Howie called me about running, after I ran in 2016, I said I was never doing this shit again because it is exhausting. It is heartbreaking. It's beating your head against a wall because a lot of what we're talking about are things people know that they need. There's a lot of enthusiasm for, for these things. And the minute that you say socialism, people go ah! like that. <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> it's like, but you want this, right? This is how we yeah. did it. And so... And just trying to be heard. And the thing I think that stood out with the 2020, you know, 2020 election cycle was you had this really odious manifestation of everything that is wrong with this country down to its core that was literally sitting in the Oval Office. So we had that working against us. We had a plague and still do. We had an uprising and still do to a degree. And so you have those three things happening and people understanding that, yo, something has got to change, but that thing that's sitting in the White House right now is so horribly bad that he, we got to get him out of there. There's dang Cheeto in the White House. Exactly. You know, Mango Mussolini, as a lot of folks like to call him. (laughs) Mango, that's the first time I heard that shit. I like alliteration on that bitch. My favorite description of him was that was mangled apricot hell beast. I thought that oh, was damn. fucking yeah. gold. <laughs> but like, oh, and it's exactly, um, we got to find ways beyond electoralism. Electoral politics, and I'm, I'm happy to tell anybody, I've always said it, it is a means to an end, but it is not an end in itself. It is a tool in a toolbox that if you have the ability to use it, If you want to use it, if it is available to you, then use that tool. But do not go cast your ballot and then stand back and say, oh, I did my part. That's it. No, because as you've seen, these people operate. Elected officials in this country are operating like damn rock stars. Like you're above the law. Well, you know what I'm saying. Like you're above the law. You don't have to listen to us. The, the The fact that you had all of this public outcry you know, bipartisan across class, across classes for something as simple and low hanging fruit as Medicare for all during a goddamn pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you have the power to make that happen. And you are looking people in the face and saying, nah, we're not going to do that. If that did not make, didn't bring it home to folks that 
these folks aren't listening to you that I don't know what. And uh, if I can, there's something I want to drive down on, especially when you mentioned like Medicare for all with uh, lo as localized control as a national health care service. And that's something that's like you added on something that like, I don't think the overall left, you know, really talks about when they, you know, even discussing Medicare for all as like a single payer health care system is also still just a band aid. You know, a single payer health care system does not fix the closed down hospitals uh, that, you know, that does not fix the the hospitals and health care centers that are just should be there that are not yeah. there, yeah. you know, and so especially in rural um, America, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and like, I mean, uh, Paul, you probably tell us pretty good, right? Like, I mean, I, I know that uh, Phil, Philly's gone through a few, um, especially maybe like two years ago. Uh, one of the well, major Hahnemann, Hahnemann Hospital, right? Was yeah. closed down, yeah. And I mean, that's one of many across the nation. Uh, New York City, you know, Cuomo has just been going gangbusters with with with, with tearing about that uh, healthcare system. So, there, yeah, I just you know wanted to recognize that as something that you said that Medicare for all and talking about this is like single payer insurance. It's it's still bullshit. And if the most left in this in this country isn't talking about an actual healthcare service. A nationwide healthcare service, then we are we are doing you know a disservice on that. So well, to to what Angela said, do you think it's a bit of like capitalist realism? Like we're so caught up in the rock star like nature of these political figures that once all that energy is put into a campaign um, to elect you know progressives and then we kind of sit back and and wait for the progressives to do all this work with no real organized left no real relationship to workers movements um and i know i, mean, I think people did exactly what 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 angela said and especially now it's like with aoc is like the the the, the most popular like yeah. target in the world you know and like not that i'm saying that she can't be critiqued I am frustrated with the amount of energy that goes into critiquing her because right. there is not enough power in that one brown lady that's running the district of that's you know and a, a, a fucking sophomore like there's just not enough power in right. that one body. Yeah, and and, and I think but yeah, yeah, it's just frustrating to see so much time wasted. Go for it, Paul. Yeah, and I think part of the problem overall with this, and there's a great article. And Jack was, I mean, it was written years ago by Seth Ackerman called Blueprint for a New Party. And then part of the problem is like, we actually don't have real political parties in like they do in other countries where you're actually a member of the party. You pay dues to it. You have some level of control mm -hmm. over it. And the parties, you know, I think we are, our understanding of electoral politics is so distorted here because we don't have our own labor or socialist party. And I think in these other countries that do, you don't have these kind of like, to me, there's sometimes a weird debate about like, well, we, either we shouldn't care about elections or we should totally. It's like for them, it's kind of this basic understanding that, of course, we need to engage in elections as an expression of our power in society. And it's easier to think that way when you have a party that can legitimately say we are a labor party, we're a socialist party, mm -hmm. things like that. I think that there's a much more healthy understanding of like, the parties and the movement go together. And in fact, in the best cases, the labor parties or socialist parties are active agents of facilitating movements as they're running candidates. But in this country, we don't have that. And I think it really kind of no. distorts that kind of thing. And, you know, like my, my father's from Barbados. They have, in fact, they have two labor parties. Both their parties are labor party. And, you know, so growing up and my, a lot of people in my family were active in the party and as union people, you know, it was a very basic thing of like, yeah, the Labor Party, of course, we're going to engage in elections. Of course, we need our people. We need to have uh, the majority in government at the same time as we're doing our work in our unions. You know, it should flow together. But because we don't actually have real parties, you're not a member of the Democratic Party. You're not like you don't pay dues. You don't have no. any control. It, it really is distorts what we can do here. And and what's interesting that when you say that, uh, Pascal and I talked to uh, Brian Mayer of Brazil Wire, and uh, I was in Brazil in 2019, and while I was there, there was a huge strike because the president, uh, Bolsonaro, was trying to, like, either privatize pensions or kill pensions or raise the age 
uh, uh, when you could get your pension. I forgot exactly what he was doing, but pretty much large swaths of the country shut down to the point where airports shut down. They were burning tires in the freeway. So that should be, it wasn't like, you know, you see these protests where motherfuckers shut the freeway down, take a bunch of selfies. <laughs> they, they, they go about their business. Right. They shut down all public transportation in Sao Paulo, which is like the biggest city right. in, in the country. And the Workers' Party in Brazil is a great, ex you know, and they're not perfect. None of these parties. Are, in fact, mm -hmm. many labor parties in Europe are starting to sell out. But I'd still rather be in a position to have have a labor party to sell out than nothing, but. Or to have a real left. And, that, and that's what right. he's talking about. He's like, and Brian's from the States. He's like, there's no real left right. in America like there is in places like Brazil. And, and in Brazil, that was built up over time. I mean, they started out in a decades. region. Right. And I mean, kind of in the 80s, and they first were contending for these lower level seats. And they just built that shit up. I mean, literally over 30, 40 years to the point where they could lead a national government. Um, but you know, even when they were small, at least they had a party of their now, own. Can I ask and, and take million, tens of millions of people out of poverty once you know, once Lula gets into office? Right. And you know, the, the, you could definitely critique Lula when he gets in office, and the and the the political machine in Brazil is very different than what we have here, the way it's set up. I'm sorry, go ahead, Marcus. Well, I was, I mean, I was going to ask if uh, if anyone sees any real building, you know? And like, I mean, um, I think DSA is now is like one of the bigger, at least most popular, um, just because of some of the uh, elected officials have been able to come in. Um, but, you know, Socialist Alternative, PSL, there's a few other organizations that are growing, you know? So um, do we see that as something that could be in our future that, you know, hey, as long as we act in, in, in correct ways of solidarity to organizing that we can get to there, you know, to, to those functions? Or do y'all think that we're kind of like completely lost and we're starting from like ground zero? I want, I want to see where here. Of... I was going to let Angela talk, Trey. Why don't you let the ladies eat first, Trey? Oh, damn. Y'all are so bad. We are terrible to each other. Y'all are so bad. It's because we love each other, though. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I am a stan of this podcast, so y'all already know. I know it's love. I think that it's possible. I think that one of the things that inhibits us here in this country with building a left that may not be something that inhibits people in other countries, and y'all please correct me if I'm I'm not speaking correct, but... um. We got a problem in this country of believing in what's possible. We, a, a whole lot of us don't believe that socialized medicine, something that, that the government is running so that it is something that everyone gets. We don't think that that's possible, even though Cuba has been doing this beautifully mm -hmm. for decades and they're not far from us. And I have been very willing and very open about, you know, sharing this with us. We in this country don't believe in what is possible. We we're afraid, you know, which is what is, is up that against with that. Hmm? Sister, Sister, Sister Angela, isn't that capitalist realism that we can envision a world with no war before we can envision a world with no capitalism. And that's, and, and, and Mark Fisher's, Get the book. I'll put a link up to the book. Of course, it's a zero book. It's like 90 pages long, but it's a series of essays kind of about how stuck within capitalism that we are, that we just can't get beyond it. And I see that in, in electoral politics. I see that in the online left, which, of course, isn't isn't the real. Who one. can I ask? Who I mean, like, is that like a prevailing thing? Is like we can end end war before cap like because like. I mean, we say war is a racket. Mm -hmm. I, right. Like yeah. almost every time, it's like, like when we talk about military funding, that is the the gangster of capitalism, right? That is the motherfucker 
that gets to, to that's holding the baseball bat. That's to knock right. the knees out of every country that says, no, we don't want to have the U.S. dollar as 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 our base fucking currency whenever we sell shit out of our country. No, we don't want to let in all you motherfuckers to do whatever infrastructure or put whatever shit you want to do, sell whatever bullshit to our people. Anytime that happens, guess right. what? War comes and, knocking. And that's what, I mean, going back to something Pascal noted before about the Johnson administration, I mean, the Vietnam War killed the freedom budget, which would have created basically social democracy, at least in this country. Um, but Jason, I don't know if he meant the quote. I think the quote he might have meant was, um, we can envision the end of the world before end of capitalism. I'm looking that, for it now. Yeah, I think it's that, which um, oh. makes more sense to me. But, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think to Marx's <laughs> point, I was like, what? <laughs> hold up, hold up, hold up. To Marcus's we gotta, earlier, we gotta develop a book, a book list for our readers, for our viewers. Maybe. Right. Look, we can't be giving these people all this free shit. <laughs> speaking of speaking, capitalist, of free shit. speaking of capitalist realism, what do you want? Free shit? <laughs> By the way, what do you think you I know, am? Super chat, super Black chats Lennon? are working. Super chats are working. Please contribute to the super chats if you feel so inclined. Subscribe, share, and like our page. Hit the bell. Also, Jason will be putting up our link to our Patreon page as well. Yeah, at some point. But to Marcus's earlier point, it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Angela. No, I was just uh, this Graham in the chat. I don't know if I'm uh, getting your title wrong. Is talking about you know holdups in Savannah or Havana? Excuse me. About you know it's not what we think it is, but. And I respect that. And also, I didn't get diagnosed in this country under this current healthcare system with fibroids that I've suffered from my entire life, adult life, until I was 40, 45 years old under this particular system. Mm -hmm. So if I am wrong for believing that the possibility of something is better coming from a city where every major hospital in, that serves the inner city has been closed, where healthcare access is a joke for most people, where most of my life, if I did not have health insurance through my job, I didn't have it at all. Um, if I feel that, you know, the possibility of socialized medicine somewhere, no, I'm, I'm 47 actually. Um, if I feel that the the concept of socialized medicine would be better than what we currently have, that's why I feel that way. Because most of my life, I have not had access to medical, proper medical care. And the stories about medical apartheid that every Black woman I know can tell are absolutely <coughs> egregious. And I'm sure that you know that too. So that's why I said what I said. Uh, and I, like, I don't think there's like there's really no way for anyone to argue that our healthcare system, you know, is somehow something that we could stand on and talk down to almost any other nation, because our healthcare system is actually a detriment to healthcare everywhere, while giving small crumbs of healthcare to those that can gain right. access to it. So, and that, and the thing is too is like when we talk about imagining this is something that we talk about, at least I try to talk about all the time. The United States, we have a fully government-run healthcare system nationwide. Not We've got, VA. we do have a foothold that we could actually expand from, right? And some of it's just replicating programs and systems, having people come from one payroll to another payroll, right? We're not talking about all these big leaps, you know? Hospital buildings are hospital buildings. The VA that I go to, it looks exactly like your fucking hospital. But guess what? They don't ask me how they they don't tell me ask me like how do I how am I gonna pay for this when I walk in? I just put my little stuff in a little right. kiosk. They say, "Hey, did you get here safely? Yeah. You feeling depressed? Anything? No, I'm good today. All right, please sit. They'll be with you in 15 minutes. When I leave, all I gotta do is schedule when I'm coming back." And there is a, one of these fools, Tom Watson, big neolib piece of shit. He said, oh, I didn't have to ask, they didn't ask when I pay. I could get used to this type of stuff. But he was one of the biggest advocates against, you know, Bernie Sanders being able to win a primary and everything like that. One of the biggest people against actually having 
structures that would provide this for everybody. And the thing that's like kind of, this is what makes, you know, it's kind of depressing me to think about is that we're in such a diseased landscape that even something that would be beneficial to capital, i.e. a healthier workforce, is something that they argue against only for the sheer benefit of a portion of the market. And that's something that's just like, holy shit. And Paul, you were you were right. It is it is the imagine the end of the world before we can make okay. sense of capitalism? You you were correct. I was wrong. So yeah. I can and what say. were you but, What were you gonna say, Paul? Before I cut you off. I'm oh sorry. no, no. I mean, I think to Marx's question a while ago about just like where you know where are we on the left and stuff like that. And I think, um, to me, I mean, there's no. It's all relative, but there's no doubt we're still in a better position than we were in 2014. And I think even looking at the Bernie campaign, and this is something I think Bernie himself said, and I think he's right. Like we are winning the battle of ideas because polls, you know, show on uh, Medicare for all, for example, most people agree with us, but we haven't won the, you know, the battle of politics and organization and that can't come overnight. But I think, again, we're, we're in a better place than we were. More people are breaking out of that capitalist realism logic all of a sudden so many things are on the table now that weren't even though we don't have the power to win them yet um but i think you know i'm i mean i'm an active member of dsa and i'll I'll freely admit dsa is kind of all over the place i mean you'll get different things going on in different chapters and obviously i'm uh going to be biased to say like i think what we're doing in philly is good but i think if we're if we play our cards right in this moment we can develop something real and I think, you know, in Philly, we have been working with a lot of um, unions and actually making big strides on Medicare for all within the labor movement and getting more unions that before were not involved bought into that. And I think that's the kind of work that I think builds on an institutional level to get us to that point of having the power beyond just winning the battle of ideas, because that's not even half the battle. So, you know, it's hard to, to say because it's all relative, but you know, think about what it was like in 2014. I'd say we're on better terrain now than we Man, were I was, then. I was, I was deployed in 2014. I had my head up my own ass of imperialism in 2014. <laughs> so I've come a long way. But yeah, that's, I mean, there's something that, like I've had to see is like, that's, well, that's why I'm here, right? It's like uh, the questioning of like, why the hell did Obama send me all these places? Mm-hmm. He was supposed to be the hope and change dude. Um but I, I mean, things are different now, you know, like at least especially too, it's like with young people than they were, you know, like, yeah, there was a, a huge movement fighting the Iraq war that like actively got tamped down by the government. Um, I'd like to think people are, 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 are getting more and more anti-war, but that's like the thing, like, I don't know. It, um, I think they are to a degree, right? I think I think to a degree people don't want to see their family members go off to fight, which is why the draft, I think if there was another draft, people would lose their shit. There's a there's often the persons in the chat that that wants to bring back the draft um because he thinks that that would be the most anti-war thing to do because then people would would really push back against uh imperial I, I don't know how I, I mean like that. I've I've heard that argument but yeah, I will, I, go ahead. This, I mean, in one way, I agree with uh, with Paul what he was saying, and I think Angela, since her, 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 she and I are closer in age, I think we will agree in this sense that the op- the political Overton window in terms of what is able to be gussed as policy prescriptions has expanded significantly in recent history. But it is still at a time in which we have a very burgeoning reactionary right wing as well. So it's a weird phenomenon. We have an expanding Overton window from the left, but we also have a growing reactionary movement on the right. So I'd like to hear people's thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think... um... Kind of like going off what Paul was saying, it was like winning the idea or winning the battle of ideas, but not like the battle of actions. You know, <laughs> how do you, how do you, you know, I guess yeah, I, that's. I think you're right. 
I, that, I mean, honestly, too, is like I, I look to you, Angela. You know, you you you've got organizing like experience. You've got experience galvanizing people to your cause. So, like, I mean, it just depends. I mean, a lot of the organizing that I did, you know, was you know, I was the the legislative director for the transit union where I'm from for a while, and so getting people using that as a jump off for other things that the community needed was kind of, it wasn't that hard. I wasn't having to build from the ground up with that because transit is a hub for me was a hub issue to all sorts of other things. Like, like people getting, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like people getting Medicare access or like the fact that people who a lot of people in Milwaukee, cause I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin originally. Um, a lot of folks in Milwaukee who use public transit are also people who use who are using services provided, you know, by the state. And so you need to know when they're cutting your access to food stamps. You need to know when they're trying to pass a bill that that would make certain things that were currently misdemeanors upgrade them to felonies. Yeah. You need to know about that kind of shit. So it was easy I guess for me to organize people around those things because they were, you know, things that were right there. And I was already in that coming from where I am right now that I live in a city where I don't really know who who's moving things. What is super important to people here because the South is a whole different place. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is Florence, South Carolina. So, you know, it's not like this hot bed of yeah. unrest. Yeah. 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 <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, what is important to people. So, you know, that landscape changes as far as, as what you want to organize folks around. Um, it's, it's tricky. But I think that one of the most important things that we can do as far as being leftist and particularly being, being Black leftist or if you're a BIPOC le leftist, stand on that shit. Stand on that shit. Like... If these are the things that you believe in, don't dig your, don't, don't be pushed back because, you know, of the things that the, the Democrats have co-opted from us, have taken from us and watered down and then handed to the public. No, stand on the fact that we are unapologetically left. We, we're not asking for single payer. We're asking for a socialized medicine program that is administered by the government because they owe it to you as a as someone who lives in this country they owe these things to you the same health care that these folks are receiving who are are elected officials and that their family receives why do you not deserve the same thing we're paying for it you you should have it too and so i think that just being unapologetically leftist because like y'all are saying we do there is a, a a growing push towards fascism in this country i mean just call it what it is and yeah. oh. i want to i'd like to interject because you, you're making some important points i want to really address this because you know this is you know black folk saturday uh for this is the free saturday where we don't cut it off after an hour and go to patrons only so if you guys are enjoying what you're seeing uh feel free if you feel so inclined to uh drop a couple dimes in the super chat well before i was so rudely interrupted i want to address what <laughs> that i did and i did it what, angela you said something very important you said if we're going to be black leftists stand on that i really want to talk about being black and on the left and why I believe, and I've said this on the show before, that there will be no left politics in America without black people. Now, I'm not saying without black politics. I said without black people participating. And one of the reasons why I believe that is that if black people don't participate in the left, black politics will be used to neutralize right. the left. Crush it. And, and I think that for me, one of one of the big I think what you said is absolutely correct. And then the big question this is posed on the left, and there's so many disagreements, is how to involve black people in politics. And 
my thing I'm been railing against because my experience with organizing is cutting against this logic all the time is I think there's many people. And in my experience, mostly white people who assume that, oh man, if we're going to organize with black people, we got to use the most woke racial language all the time. That's the only way it's going to happen. And then again, in my experience, which is not universal, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing in Philly. It really has not been about that. Like, it's yeah. not like, Black people are out there waiting for people to, to sound like whatever, you know, it, it's more about engaging on the issues that people care about. I mean, like what Angela was saying, like in many cities, yeah, public transit is something that's going to affect many people, especially black working people. You know, it, it just so happens that, you know, in a city like Philly, if you're engaging with the labor movement, you're engaging with an extremely diverse constituency inherently. And many of the unions we work with are, you know, like sanitation workers union, uh, union UPS workers, I'm in the, uh, the teachers union, these are all unions with majority black membership and also black leadership. And so that's where I get a little worried that I think people are making certain assumptions about how to engage black people, which of course is not a monolith, which we all understand. And I think they're drawing kind of wrong conclusions that everyone out there is like a black panther and waiting yeah, waiting to hear the most militant racial rhetoric. I don't think it works that way. No, and I, I'm like honestly, like I think you are, Paul. You're hitting like, I, like what, uh, me and Jason or Jason and I, right? To be grammatically correct, <laughs> uh, so no one comes at me. Uh, what Jason and I had talked about, like before we had started, you know, doing these streams and everything like that, uh, and just make sure people know and like ties into what uh pascal says all the time they're like black politics is the class politics there's no yeah I mean, like you said there's no one way to talk to black people right there's just a way to get more americans to your side right and that's with just dealing with the issues that affect their lives if you're dealing with transit you're dealing with woke, working folks, and we happen right. to live in a society that has oppressed certain communities so much that if you are just connecting on these levels, guess what? You're going to get there on those other ones too. Um, so there is no, yeah, like the this idea that there needs to be like, well, how do we reach black people? You know, that is right. a very D triple C three white people in the room question. Um, well, listen, I, th I think that. I agree with you that the whole how do we reach black people is a very top down kind of uh, position to have. But at the same time, we cannot deny that contemporary mainstream black politics is a politics of containment in a cartel system. And what do I mean by that? Hmm. I mean that when the South Carolina Democratic primary goes down, Jim Clyburn goes into his phone Rolodex and he has the phone number of every pastor or every major black church. He has the phone number of every graduate chapter of every black fraternity and sorority. He has the phone number of every black HBCU president and administrator. He has the phone number of all the black social organizations, the links, the Freemasons, the Elks, all of those organizations. And those people control the ideological infrastructure of black communities in South Carolina. They control the ladies clubs. They control the teachers unions. They teach the kids. They control the social, the church social meetings. They control the social infrastructure of black communities. And if we do not become honest about how black politics, particularly in the South, and particularly in other democratic machine states, works to keep black politics totally wedded to the corporate center of the Democratic Party, we are not going to be able to effectively introduce a left political discourse to black people. As many people don't like to hear this, I've never met a political scientist yet who can deny me that this is how black politics on the electoral level is effectuated every elected election season. I mean, uh, Angela, you worked in, am, am I wrong? I'd like to hear your thoughts. You're absolutely right. You are absolutely and right. And she's in I, South Carolina. And I'm in South Carolina. And, you know, was on the ballot in South Carolina. And the fact that, you know, when I actually talk to people who are workers here, because as y'all know, I'm a truck driver. 
That's what I do. And so talking to people like people I worked with who, you know, off the job, let me just go on and say that because <laughs> the internet is forever. I did not have these conversations yeah. on y'all property. Okay. <laughs> now, that I've, now that I've said that, <laughs> um, when conversations came up, um, they were all on board with what our platform was. And people are aware of the fact that they are being fed the Democratic Party, being pushed towards the Democratic Party. There's a whole lot of people who tend to be younger folks that are like, why, why do we only have these two choices to choose from? Why aren't y'all, you know, if you're on the ballot, why aren't we seeing you? Why aren't y'all billboarded up all over the place you know so it, it, it also opened the discussion or opened the space for the fact that you know while we're talking about voter suppression as Howie Hawkins loves to say voter party suppression is a form of voter suppression yeah, and it, you know people need to know we exist but listen how why is it that, okay listen we are blacks on the left I'm a member of the green party uh you know some of y'all may not be but let's be very frank you know some of us are in DSA. Some of us supported Bernie Sanders. Why is it there? There is no actual conversation about how black politics really work. The first time I'm 52 years old, the first time I've ever heard mm -hmm. someone admit how black politics really works was Willie the Get on a Jackman interview with Adolf Reed. And Cedric Johnson, and I heard him say the same thing less than a month ago on Janice Graham's show. He affect and and, he, and I'm not trying to be original. He literally said the same thing I'm saying right now. He said this is a cartel system where you have black political elites use the social infrastructure in black communities to corral black votes around the corporate center of the Democratic Party. And he literally said, you have membership organizations, you have the churches, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. No one talks about this. Very few people write about it, very people analyze it, and very few people have come up with a strategy to penetrate this reality. Well, I mean, I guess it depends when you say no one. So, because I, I mean, when you asked that originally, I was about to say, well, you know, I hear people like who just listed talk about it. And I think more people are getting that hearing. Now, on the other hand, there are people on the left. And again, I, I always go back to this because it's so ironic. Mostly white leftists that don't want to hear that shit. And I was involved in a DSA event. Wait, let's let's getting, talk about that. Talk about it. I'm just saying, you know, I, I was involved in a, a DSA event organizing with. Adolph Reed to speak about COVID disparities. Oh, the that was in your hood? That it was a, oh. we collaborated with New York. Oh, damn. Deep State got Paul. Oh, man. Yeah, come Deep on State now. Was That's getting, well, he was giving, uh, there was something he was like his. He was giving, he was feeling all the tea. Deep State oh, here got he goes. Paul. Right, right, okay. But yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, Still, I think it's a net positive. I think more people are hearing this and having to confront it. And I think stuff like the Bernie campaign, what is good about it is just because it's practical political experience. And like for a whole generation of people, you know, the Bernie campaign was their first experience having to come against the wall of the machine, whether that's the overall Democratic Party machine or the black political machine and what that looks like. And people, you know, there's no better lesson than experience that to draw lessons from. So I do think slowly more and more people are confronting this question and, and how to deal with it. Um, but again, I think many leftists are going down the wrong path of like, ah, the problem is we didn't read Robin D'Angelo three times instead of one time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to address Paul. Let me address Paul. Let me address Paul. Paul, I, I'm going to be, maybe I'm a little cynical. I really don't care. I'll be a, I don't believe that most of the white left takes black politics or black people seriously. No. Point, well, point blank. Well, I would agree, but my in you know, my take on that is they they think they're taking it seriously by being as woke as possible. But for me, that is a way of actually showing you're not taking it seriously. Um I mean, 
there's a lot I could I could say there, but um, I think people think they are, but they're what they're being told is taking black politics seriously is being like hyper woke on everything or the Robin D'Angelo. You know, I'm not saying everyone in DSA loves Robin D'Angelo. You know, that that's just one example. But um, you know, a lot of what we talk about on the show of like what is kind of characterizes black politics. You know, even leftists who think they understand what's up or what, you know, mm-hmm. how cynical this is, they they're searching for like the the good kind of woke identity politics. I've had this kind of, you know, I don't know if I'm I'm you a know, Robert D'Angelo does open up her, her talks with a land acknowledgement. So there's always that. There you go. If someone wants to know uh your take on the and if you can't talk about it, I understand. The Adolf Reed DSA uh, Afro Socialist Caucus beef. Oh well, I mean that got to the event. I mean, very briefly. I mean, some of you have seen the article. You know, Adolf um, with someone else wrote, honestly, from by Adolf standards, a very uh, mild piece about COVID and racial disparities. And he was saying, you know, all this talk about black people being disproportionately, um, you know, affected by COVID. It uh, it would be helpful to kind of look at the data along with socioeconomic data. Because when you do that, you're going to find that, of course, you know, Black people that are disproportionately working class may not have as good access to health care or disproportionately in essential worker jobs are going to be disproportionately affected. And he's saying there's a danger that when you kind of, and you, you saw this in news reports all the time, it was like, just Black people are disproportionately affected. And it leaves you thinking that, oh, there must be a biological thing going on. And he was kind of just offering a warning that, you know, this uh, this can lead down a bad path and give people the impression that this is like a biological thing. It also can lead it to be um, framed as something that is marginal, meaning, you know, oh, this is only something that affects poor Black people. We don't need this to take COVID seriously, like being utilized in the right wing in that mm. way. So that's really all the article said again by Adolf standards. I think it was very mild and we wanted to do an event about um, this topic, you know, talking about it based on this article. And this was, you know, I think it was the timing. We, we planned this event before, but this also, we wanted to do this event. Um, This is while, you know, George Floyd protests were happening very heavily. And so I think the environment was very charged and, you know, there was just this uproar um, about having this event, even though, it was very clear what the event was about. It was not about denying racial disparities. It was just about parsing through uh, what is causing these disparities. Um, it's not necessarily race as a biological factor causing these disparities. And, you know, people people freaked out. And it was, you know, there's no, no nothing else to say. I, I guarantee you people could not have read the article because if you read the article, there's no way you could have come away from that thinking this is denying racial disparities. There's just no way. So I would like, I'd like to hear Angela's take on my proposition that I've made earlier that the white left does not take black politics or black people seriously in a political context as a green party, vice presidential candidate. I'd like to hear your reflection. I have to agree. And if that ruffles people's feathers, it just damn does. Um, (laughs) I cannot tell you how many brochures that I haven't, I've Mm. had to put in their place when they are admonishing or or reminding me that um, my lived experience as a black working class parent, uh, queer person, all of those things that come into my work and my organizing and my politics with me when they're trying to reduce it just to class. Everything's Everything is, you can just fix everything if we just, you know, it's it's all class. You know, all of these other things that you're talking about that need to be addressed, we don't have time to listen to that. It's only about this. And it's like, no, it's not only about that, which is why, you know, you're, you're not handling your implicit bias, your racism, your classism, your sexism, all of those things are going unchallenged by you, your, your trans and homophobia. Mm-hmm. All of those mm-hmm. things are going unchallenged and you don't have to look at yourself. You don't have to look at 
what really moves your politics because you are not doing any self-examination because you reduce everything to just about class because that's where you're comfortable. Well, fuck your comfort. Mm. Fuck your comfort. I'm mm. not here for comfort. Everything, and I've had those discussions with so many people, and I'll be completely transparent. That is a battle that is currently happening within the Green Party. So like y'all were saying in you know the 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 chat earlier about you know the green party got a whole lot going on yes the hell they do yes mm. they do and mm. you will never hear me push the green party as and i know you know too pascal it ain't a damn utopia it's a whole lot of people there i want to damn choke if you want to be honest about it but um it's just like why are you wasting my time but at the end of the day I think that black leftists, like I said, we, we're going to have to be bold with our shit and unapologetic about it like this and, and understanding also that a lot of this is pushing back, pushing back against not just people outside of the left, but also people within it. Not coming into this thinking that, you know, just because we all categorize ourselves as leftists, that we're all of one, all of one, we're cut from the same cloth. No, the hell we're not. It's a lot of people that, that call themselves leftists that are also very, very invested in capitalism, that don't understand why some of this shit is a problem. You, got, you call yourself a leftist, but you hate socialists. The fuck is that? So... We got a lot of work to do on that, but you know, we, yes, there are, there are white leftists that are absolutely racist, that are misogynist, that are misogynoirist, that are transphobic. And it's, that's I, a problem. Some of them is like, you know, like you talk about the brochures, you know, and, and I would like people, you know, if you're, if you're a white person and you're thinking like, wow, why are these black people attacking me? I'm a, I'm an ally, right? You know, um, the thing is, you need to realize that, like, when the, like, the, the, the oh, hey, we, it's, we got to go class first, and we need to not worry about some of these race issues, some of these gender issues, some of these LGBTQ issues, right? Those are all distractions, right? No, right? The fact that you, brochelist, are not addressing your your own issues, right, is 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 hampering the movement from being able to organize and coalesce. So if that's not fixed or removed, right, then you're going to continue on with these haphazard uh, attempts at movement building or just going to be more hiccups, more bumps in the road, right? So understanding, yeah, like it is in the service of class for you to ignore the issues concerning marginalized communities. Well, that, and that's the, that's the problem with people. And someone said in the chat that Adolf Reed plays a role in white people seeing this class first thing. And I don't view Adolf Reed in that way, maybe because I, and, and I believe the person that said that probably has read class notes. But living in this community, right? And also, also getting to know Ture very fucking well one thing we talk about daily is fucking racism. We talk about the shit we deal with daily. You know what I, I mean? Think, and so it's foolish to think that. Hold on, goddammit. I mean, it's foolish. Someone, Go ahead, Pasco. Oh, what's wrong? Your Wi Fi's not working again? Uh oh. That's what happens when you interrupt. <laughs> no, don't do Pascal. Don't do Pascal. I'm here for you. Go on and talk, nigga. He put on his he put on his hood and he thought he got tough. That's what he was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that you know because we I'm breaking up. What we can just talk. I said, I think because Reed challenges notions of unitary black identity and how it works in terms of the class makeup of black politics, he makes certain people black and white uncomfortable because he complicates black collective issues and identity and the notion of, you know, black collective political representation. And it gets people to make him think, you know, he's a class reductionist or whatever. And he has really, he's really hard. He's unforgiving. He's kind of brutal. 
Uh, I don't think he denies racism. I just think that a lot of people get turned off by his tone. I appreciate his tone, but hey, it's a personal thing. And and I'll say, I mean, and again, like, look, my experience on the left is not universal. I've been in Philly, and that that's that is what it is. But I I have not heard, I don't hear that often, honestly. A white leftist like being so blatantly class reductionist. If anything, my bigger issue on the left that I've seen is that most of the white people on the left are so kind of like in their head about race that they end up tokenizing people yeah. of color. That, yeah. But I, I see it less as a reflection of class reduction, reductionism as more of like being, I don't know, they, they've just gotten too fucked up in their head about race and they are so hyper-focused on it all the time that it leads to bad tokenism. Again, I know yeah, people yeah. have different experiences, but like I, I just don't encounter what, yeah, I, 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 I class agree. reductionism. This, this is my question. What class reductionist argument did Reed make? Because you can't say, well, I didn't say saying class reductionist is the same as saying he doesn't is, say racism exists. So what the fuck are you saying? When you say Reed makes the class reductionist argument, what is that argument? I want to know what argument he made where you were like, no, nigga, you're wrong. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, in Adolf's work, there is a high degree of nuance that I honestly think people just miss a lot. And I mean, whatever, maybe you could say he should write clearer or something. But time you know, out, he, time out, Paul. Is this bullshit, Pascal? Uh, I saw, I read that look, in an interview, Adolf Reed with Nathan Robinson, he said the racial wealth gap would disappear if thir- in 30 years if the income gap were neutralized. I don't, I, mean, I watched that interview. I don't think he said the racial wealth gap would disappear i think he's making the argument that the best way to uh address the racial wealth gap would be to close the gap in wages between blacks right. and whites i don't think he was making the argument that it would and disappear he, and he's drawn on statistics about how when you really zero in on the wealth gap it's it's mostly having to do with the most upper class yeah it's not the, the, like, the wealth know. gap is, is being the top 10 percent of both segments of society and i think his larger argument is that using ra- racial wealth gap data as the means of creating economic equity in a capitalist society is not the best or most effective way to do so because it ends up bringing down capitalist solutions. In other words, there's a reason why Jamie Dimon likes to talk about the racial wealth gap, right. because he can create a solution that doesn't challenge his position as a capitalist. Right. I mean, right. listen, MJ says that I was wrong. If I was, I mean, I, I'm willing, that's the way I would recall it. I mean, maybe you might be right. If he said that he, if, that it would totally neutralize the racial wealth gap in 30 years, I would disagree with them. I don't think simply uh, equalizing the income gap over 30 years will make the racial wealth gap dis- disappear. And my argument would be is that because the racial wealth gap between the top 10% are so ridiculously, insanely huge that frankly, nothing would make it disappear unless you just chop off 50% of the wealth of the top 10% and give it to the top 10% of black people. I think my problem is anytime you hear Negroes talk about some sort of like class distinctions, then there's always says, well, there's a class reductionist argument in there. Uh, th- but that's like, that's neat. It's like, it's just it gets under my, it, it gets under my yeah. to a certain point because right. it's like, my position is this is my whole thing, right? No, argument. Like, who are you? Who are you fighting for? I guess that's my, my position point. is this: is that whenever they come at come in with the class reductionist, I ask some one simple question. What problem do black people have that's not rooted in political economy? Show me one. Show me one right. problem well, that's, that you know, is not rooted in political economy. Weeks ago, Pascal, you asked me a question of like, if there was no power behind it, would you care, right? If, some, if a white person is racist be, to you, if there's no power behind it, would you care? And, you know, the answer is like, maybe a little bit, but a whole lot less than what we are forced to care, right? What are the results of, 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 of those feelings? You know, people just delineating the difference between racism and, and having a prejudice against someone who of a certain race, right? Like the, the, what are the difference of power structures, all this fucking shit. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're saying. I think at least like, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree, you know, like that's at the end of the day, there is more power in the class that, you know, class divisions than there is in the racial divisions, right? And like one leads on to another, one informs another, you know, like it just, it, 
you just got to be aware of both. You, like that's. I'm not. That would, I'm, not I, I'm not a either or race or class person because to me, race is a construct in capitalism. Period. That the racism in America disproportionately relegate black people to the reserve army of labor and all of the negative social consequences that come with that. That is all. It's that. Yeah. That's it. And to, to the point that you're making, Jason, and I ask this all the time: if black, if white people did not have the economic, material, or ideological capacity to affect your life in any way, or or your self image in any way, would you care that they were racist? Personally, I wouldn't give a damn. I, I've I've said this before, I think, but I would love to do a game where we put up quotes from people like A. Philip Randolph and Baird Rustin, but don't say they said it and mm. let people freak out at how class reductionist they seem. Because I mean, I think people would really be shocked, um, you know, that figures who were so central to the civil rights movement advanced stuff that, you know, at that time it was actually very normal to say, but now if someone like Adolf Reed says it, he gets jumped on. I'll be very frank with you. The reason why I think people who are on the left or socialists or black leftists are being called class reductionists is because the liberal establishment is so interested in coddling racial grievance discourse today to neutralize class-based social remedies. Thank and you. any challenge that hustle, you're going to be called a class reductionist. Thank you. But And the problem is, I think too many people of the left fall into the trap and join in the chorus Oh, here, it comes. here it comes. Median white family household in Boston is over 250000 For black families, it's $8. That's from a 2015 Federal Reserve report. Would a class-only politics address this? Well, that's the median. Which is the so, average. What's the average? That, that is, that's the problem. No, the no, same. That's, that's, that's $250,000. So you're going to say that if I just walk up to a white person in Boston, I'm going to meet a dude that makes $250,000? I'm talking away from fucking Cambridge. Right. No real and what's talk. It, and you what's the, me this, the, that's the, the average white guy in Boston makes a quarter fucking mil, or right. there's a lot of fucking millionaires in Boston. Yeah, what's the mean? That's the right. question. And what's amazing to me that Come gets on. you're better than that. That doesn't get emphasized. I gotta talk to you like the fucking strippers now. You're better than that. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> don't hate on the former stripper, be gentle. Yeah, don't, 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 don't. That's don't. the joke we use about the dudes at the strip club that. But, but uh, you know, what's amazing about, and this is, I think, how you can see how, like Pascal said, I like, know why, what the average means. Sorry. Like why why someone like Jamie Dimon is interested in the racial wealth gap, but like when they talk about it, it's always amazing to me when talking about black wealth, they don't bring up public sector employment, where it is an empirical fact that the greatest factor mitigating black poverty throughout history has been public sector employment, which is disproportionately black workers are in the public sector, and these are jobs that are disproportionately unionized and have good job stability and a good wage. And you can look at the data. Black public sector workers disproportionately own homes, have more wealth than private sector counterparts, period. It is a fact. And, but again, that it, so it's like, yeah, I think if we, you know, create robust public sector employment, I think that's going to go a long way towards addressing. Again, I'm not saying it's going to solve every no. problem in the world. I'll, I, I'll quote I, Hillary Clinton. So, like, thing, my question I'll is, quote why, Hillary Clinton. Bring up, why, why bring up this statistic? You gonna tell me what I know, what I fucking don't know? Let me ask and you. I've been with numbers all throughout my twenties, working in fucking finance. So, so before you say, oh, hold on, you gonna have the audacity of blackness, the blackness to tell me, oh, you don't know what means means. Why bring up the statistic if it's bullshit? First of all, as someone who lived in Boston, as Janice Graham did, let me tell you why I know why this. Because first of all, the, the statistic is. Black people who live in Boston. Number one, if you know anything about Boston and Black Boston, the Black people who live in Boston don't live in Boston proper. They live in the suburbs. It's ironic to me that you talk about how broke Black people are in Boston, but you just take a ride up to Martha's Vineyard and they all got million-dollar homes. 
It's really incredible. The whole study is not based on the actual political geographic reality of where black life economically is spread in Boston. Janice Graham lived in the Boston metro area. She had a lot more than $8. Ask her if she was in the $8 co co cohort. I don't think so. Because the the whole the whole scam of this racial wealth gap nonsense is like all white people are rich and all the black folk is broke. <laughs> but you and can't tell that to nobody. You can't tell really, that to nobody. And it's really disturbing because and I didn't catch on to this, I think, until later in the 2020 Bernie campaign. Over and over, more and more I realized, wow. The racial wealth gap thing kept being brought up as the reason not to support Bernie. And in many cases, to support Warren over Bernie. And that's when I really started thinking, like, damn, something is messed up here. Because this is being weaponized in a very damaging... Again, I'm not saying anyone who talks about the racial wealth gap is reactionary. I'm not trying to say that. But I was saying it was being weaponized in a really, really bad way during the Bernie campaign. So it should just give give us some pause about talking, you know... How does See, this, yeah, this is where though it's like I think you know, and I'm gonna uh, bring in our guests, you know, who we've been talking over for for quite some time now, because in some sense, like it has to be both. Not nothing that that Angela listed when he said this is my platform. Not one thing said mentioned black people, and so how like obviously both things can exist and like and that's the thing too is like maybe this conversation of people who are trying to put on this class reductionist role it, it yeah it, it may be not like existing too much well, you know like well, because, the, you know, it me off because it's like look man i live in oakland and where i'm staying at right now is very different than where i was staying at before and i could walk up the street across the street and there's a lot of negroes with good money where i'm staying at now where I'm saying that before, I'll see the $8 in, in wealth, whatever the fuck that means. When you start to ask people to define what that means, then they start to have a fucking problem with it. But when cats like this jump up, like getting all bent out of shape, it's like, look, motherfucker, you talking about real shit. This is real people's lives that we really get fucked with about. You're not going to get fucked with about it because if you're a white dude that's fucking righteous talking about it's all about white supremacy, then hell motherfuckers love you. Fucking love you. When you say, I don't, you know what? I have my critiques about that shit. Well, I'll always, I'll always love the fact that no one ever talks about how the actual racial wealth gap internally within blacks is almost as bad as it is between blacks and whites in many, many, in many areas. And we want to talk about racial wealth gaps. But that, yes. And that, like, that's what I'm saying, though, right? Is because I don't think anyone and, and yeah use, using angela as an example is like no one looks at angela and says like oh well either she is a race reductionist because she comes in and 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 corrects some 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 white dude that's speaking out of line or also not a class reductionist because nothing in the actual policy platform specifically says hey this is good for this is just for black people because in the end, it does no benefit to the left or just to the, the humanity that we are, are, are trying to improve to, to, to work along either of those lines. We need to uh, just understand and, and move in, in, uh, with the, the understanding that, yeah, like the, the, the class definition that capital will utilize race. And these are things so entrenched in the United States that like, it's almost no fucking point in having the argument differently, right? Of just saying, hey, what are we going towards, right? A structure mm -hmm. of healthcare that that if you are a if your heart's pumping, we want to help you free at charge when you come in the door. You know, education, same way. All, jobs guarantee. Make it simpler, right? And that's where the thing is where you say, Oh, hey, like I could be called a class reductionist. Because I'm not a, like I'm just saying, hey, if you make these things universal, it will solve a lot of the issues. You still will have racial problems, right? The person who's actually delivering these goods and services will still find a way to be an asshole to a black person if this person is racist. The systematic ability for that person to do so will be lessened. And so, I don't know. the question I always ask is that 
if 65% of your labor were sharecroppers or domestic workers until 1965, and 55% of your, of your quote-unquote community would live below the poverty line until 1959, why are you shocked that there are more black people who are poor than white people? How is that shocking? It's not shocking. The, the, I mean, the racial, the whole, the race, listen, the racial wealth course is very simple. It's about trying to get black people to believe that they can create equity in capitalism without challenging capitalism. Be a homeowner. You want to get out of this racial wealth gap? Be a homeowner. That's what's going on in Evanston, Illinois. And what it will end up becoming is a wealth transfer to the black middle class, just like reparations will be a wealth transfer to the black middle class. What is that? What is the Evanston plan? The Evanston plan is a wealth transfer to the black middle class. That's all it is. Wrapped in that's reparations. Wrapped, wrapped, in, wrapped, in, wrapped in reparations. So that that's, I don't know. I don't know if you guys get a little worked up about shit like yeah. I mean, I think I part of the it. problem too, we get and then we get into a thing of semantics because you know, class reductionism means different things to different people. Reparations does, and then you know, once you kind of go down the like semantics rabbit hole, these convers you know they get to be unproductive conversations. Um, but you know, I think I, I was watching. I think Adolf did a thing with uh, Jared Ball and. Um, you know, and Adolf said that it, it's not really race first or class first, I'm capitalism first. And I think that kind of gets back to Pascal's thing and what he was saying, and that was not I'm class first. What he was saying was race's role in capitalism first. Um, so yeah, I think broadly speaking, I think, you know, it's unfair to paint someone like Adolf or Toure as class first. You know, I think there's just so much more nuance to that. But I understand, you know, in the Twitter world, it's very hard to like have a nuance you know discussion around that kind of it's, thing you know it's more about wind getting windmill dunks and retweets that's all it is. <laughs> at the end of the day that's all it's about and and, and i, I mean, think well, that's why my, i get so mad. my 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 position and by the way i had a political scientist literally try to tell me black people don't know nothing about political economy i was like do black people pay bills what does that mean this guy literally literally tried to tell me black people don't have nothing to do with political economy i was like do black people pay light bills? This is a political scientist. What is, like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What 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 does like black people have don't know nothing about no economy? This is a political scientist literally told me this. I that's fucked up. I Pascal mean, like Dan Jones would, so Dan Jones would be bad at this dude. This, <laughs> when you have literal, liberal, <laughs> neoliberal black folk. No. You got something to say, Angela? You I'm putting on my church finger. Oh. oh. <laughs> 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 um, no, the question that you just put in the chat about trans medical procedures being, would they be a red line under a national health service? Mm -hmm. I can actually speak you know, I can answer that what it would be under the medical Medicare for all program that uh, we pushed as the Green Party. It would not be a red line. Those procedures are considered medically necessary and would be covered under uh, Medicare for all the way that we have it written. Isn't it not covered in the UK or is that or it wasn't covered in the UK at one time? I'm, I'm not sure if anyone in the UK is, is watching, they can answer that question. I, I honestly don't know. I know that people in our community call the UK Turf Island, so I can't assume that. Uh, I know they're so having much. a bit of an issue over yeah. the last three years about um, about that. Shit. But that's yeah, which you know is something. Uh, oh, moving on. I think like like, like covered in the that's really important is is it's like there's also like there's a, there's a big difference between coverage and 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 where the existing healthcare is and where it's going. Um, you know, like my uh, thinking of Serena Williams, when she had to advocate for herself when she was pregnant to like, you know, save her own life. And like the, the, the fact is like, she is monumentally wealthy, right? Like insanely wealthy. Um, 
but still, right? Like when you're just dealing with a, a healthcare system that does not give a shit about you, um, yeah, bad things can still happen. Uh, so that's something where it's like, for 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 me, just being like a, 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 a like more of like a like put it on the wonk hat is where do we go looking forward? Um, because the healthcare for trans non-binary folks may not be well you know at its wherever it is optimal in our system it may not be where it needs to go so it's not just expanding it for everyone but also having just like a, a no shit direct objective to make sure that we will continue to improve um which you know i think something can be built in you know just that's how the program should run right if you're just talking about the health of people um but I think something that would be lacking if we went to, you know, national health care tomorrow, that would be something that I think would be lacking. Depending on who implemented it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, as long as you are not dealing with and there was a question in the chat earlier uh, for all of us about, you know, the weight that moralistic, moralistic arguments and I'm paraphrasing it because I can't see it anymore where does more at this idea of morality fall, you know, with these issues. And I think that as long as you have people who are, like you're saying, uh, Marcus, who would administer this as what is good for people and keep your fucking religious beliefs and all this other bullshit the fuck out of the question, because don't nobody give a shit what you believe. We don't care what is good for people as far as administering health care. How do you keep people healthy and safe and make sure that they are cared for? Keep all of the morality right. out of that. I think if we have people who would administer in that way, um, I think we could have the health service. You know, it's not going to be utopia. I have no, right. I don't want anyone thinking that I'm walking around with like flowers circling around my head thinking this is the way this shit was work. I'm not that stupid. And I'm also a Capricorn, so ain't nothing nice out here. Fuck <laughs> it. I mean, there's that. There's yeah. nothing nice. Yeah. It's always no, yeah. going to rain. So. Right. I think there's, like, there's 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 a difference between you know. I think we could we could imagine a housing pro program that could be like damn near perfect, right? You could you could imagine a housing program that's like okay, it, is it shit ten out of ten? You know, no, but it's like running water heats on lights on for everybody like that's Over something like in. we could yeah no no <laughs> roaches no nothing that's something we could easily figure out Healthcare, and i say education as well those are two things that they become a little bit tricky you know as simple as far as hey more schools better paid teachers you know all, making sure kids are fed morning evening and night on their way you know all those things <laughs> community but, schools model <laughs> yeah wait, but no but that's the thing it's like but what that's what i love and then we and jason and i we talk about restorative justice you know and it might be a same you know a similar thing it's not uh it's not just like an answer it's a practice right and i think healthcare, education those are practices that we need to have more good solid principles as we move forward and not necessarily that hey this is black and white and this is what we're doing but also sure. to locally lo focus on, on, on what the, the localities and the communities want. This brings to mind, um, I haven't seen this yet. I've heard great things about the documentary, The Power to Heal, which talks about the connection to, between the fight for Medicare and the civil rights movement. And what someone told me they found interesting was, you know, basically these civil rights activists, once the Medicare program was established, they kind of like entered into it as activists to make sure Medicare was being implemented equally, you know, um, and it was applying, you know, as equal as possible across the board. And I think that's just something interesting to think about. Like if, if the left grew strong enough to implement something like the NHS here, our cadre should be the people who are, you know, running the NHS system, you know, like, um, and I think other places that are more advanced than we are, they can talk in those terms of like, not only do we have a big political party, we could send our cadre into positions to make sure we're doing these things in the right way. I mean, we're very far from that point, but um, I would reckon I've heard amazing things about that documentary, The Power to Heal. Um, it's a little hard to get, uh, but I'm trying to see it myself.
did I just break the internet or something? Oh no, I just no, we're just nodding, man. You say <laughs> some real, and it's just like no. everyone's got nod. This nod, was agreement. Nod. Okay, right. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know what this cat's point was with the Indian wealth thing, and apparently niggas is broke, and the world ends around broke niggas. I guess. So there you go. I don't know. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I think enough has been said about. Uh, Jason's about to lose some sleep. Yeah, well, I just don't like it, man. It's 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 really oversimplifying like real ass fucking problems. And uh, you guys are right; it really became part of a major discourse during the Bernie campaign, and it's just something that a lot of people love to lean on. And uh, I don't know. I'll just keep my fucking. That's up. really we... easily. That's really easily explained. Your and I think we stuff. also. I think we also like quick fixes and easy answers in this country. We want it to go. We don't want to dig for substance. We just want something that sounds really oh, good. Like, okay, can I handle this in five minutes? Okay, fine. Next thing. We don't want to, we don't want to dig into shit. Like it's not that goddamn simple. You got two people who lit who know Boston sitting on here giving y'all like answers to this stuff. It's like, dude, stop. <laughs> you know these people are telling you what it what it is. So quick, we want we want these really facile, facile ways of getting at things. And it's I think I would I would say you know and I say it all the time that is the problem with where we are as a country because we don't like to look at root causes. We mm -hmm. don't like to dig into how we got here because the shit is ugly and it's complicated and it's messy and it's fucked up and it's really depressing <laughs> and you know it's not these things are not that simple you can't just post it's not as simple as okay black people only make this y'all make that if we do this one thing then everything's great it's not yeah. that simple oh damn because uh, I mean, uh, uh and I don't know if uh, Angela deal with that, like just dealing with the, like their transportation history, but I remember dealing with some stuff with Amtrak up here, and it's like, well, oh, hey, we have this one problem. And I was like, well, why? This doesn't make sense. Why this should be a problem? Why is this a problem? Oh, and it leads to this other thing. And it leads to this other thing. It leads to this other thing. And it always goes back to basically the U.S. government utilized its population to do some research and development or build some shit and then we sold it off and then we're we're paying for the repercussions of doing those things down the line right our rail system our high highways the internet and the fact that we do not have broadband on every inch of this like the internet that should have been tucked underneath the postal service mm -hmm. interesting Oh, that should have started been on the post service, and the, <laughs> dude, I could do a whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Right, go, dude. Go on not. a preach. Go on, go on a preach. And, well, and the thing is, as you you know, when you mentioned the uh, amount of black people who work and 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 actually have upward mobility because of governmental uh, programs, right. mm -hmm. USPS is is oh, yeah. bam top of the line for one of those, and for veterans too. Thank you, mm -hmm. USPS, for helping my brothers and sisters in arms who get to sit in the back room and not bother nobody. Um, but, but yeah, at, at, at the end of the day, I don't even know where I'm going now. I'm just so angry. Uh, hashtag free the post office. Um, yeah. hashtag, hashtag shout out mental health. Um, Question for Angela, since we're uh, stuck with having to have a department of transportation for a while, who your ideal pick secretary of transportation? Well, <laughs> It's already Pete. I mean, Hold we, on, he's asking in... Angela. Angela, you damn, you sound like Marcus. <laughs> no, I was actually, I mean, you're right. I, I just, that's a good question. Who, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head and, and you know, y'all fought me for this, if you like, um, who is <sighs> heavily invested in true green not greenwashing but green infrastructure who is a rank and file old school union supporter who he is 
who is um, concerned with what is best for growing our transportation system in a way that is healthy for ecological within ecological limits. I can't possibly, I can't, and I don't know who Sarah Nelson is. I ain't even gonna lie. So, you know, for me, that would be somebody that would be perfect for that. Somebody who thinks in those ways. Well, and I, I, I would disagree on Sarah Nelson actually, because she is the head of, uh, flight attendants, flight attendants union, um, which absolutely important for 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 transport but i think there's like some of the things that even angela was applying <laughs> um that might be yeah like out of you know her expertise because when i'm thinking of like someone that would be good for transportation yeah it'd be someone that would like that maybe an engineer you know like someone that understands huge te- you know big big technologies that are gonna have to span our nation uh multiple times you know and like someone that's obviously invested in union invested in, in act real green stuff um but that's lived things, in like, other countries to see you know and have yeah. an open mind that you've watched how green transit you know particularly thinking of mass transit because that's that's my thing you know mm-hmm. i i want to operate a high yeah. speed train because that shit's sexy as fuck is there someone um, from japan we could ask <laughs> I, I you know, want there was those a, things, you know, how do you, who, who's, who, who can bring that in with them? Right. You want to drive one, Angel? Yes. I've been a, a CDL operator. I've, I've held a CDL license for the last, a CDL for the last 20 years. This is what I dropped out of college to do. I drive big shit and I love it. I feel like a big kid in my truck. So. <laughs> how, much <laughs> worried, how much are you worried about artificial intelligence and the driverless truck phenomenon? I think it's absolutely, I have layers of concerns about this. First off, Mm. we have a highly safety sensitive job. You cannot get a computer to do what I do. I'm sorry. Mm. Also, the implications of creating a specialized, yet another specialized situation where only people who are trained to work on these self-driving vehicles will have work. You're creating a whole pool of people who are looking to be potentially displaced and therefore looked at as as expendable, more than we already are looked at as expendable. There's no, I, I don't see anything. I have no, no good feelings about that at all. Not at all. And, I, I, and I've heard things that it's like as a technological aspect of it, it's like impossible without upgrading every single road. Right. Because it's not about the car being automated. It's about the fact that every other vehicle on the road is not. Right. And, and you think about these little back ass South Carolina, these little back ass dirt roads mm-hmm. that <laughs> yeah. I'm paving. That we go in, we dig it up from like the ground up and then lay new stuff on top of that. And you're going to send a, a driverless truck in a, a road that's yay wide. You got two ditches on either side to retain water or to drain off the water. And you're going to get a computer to do that? <laughs> Fuck y'all. Yeah, no, and I think too, that at the end of the day, what people are actually talking about are just efficiencies and for one thing, in a capitalist system, 100% of the efficiencies in the market go to the top. And if we were talking about a society where we no longer rely so heavily, right? Because like I say, hey, if you get high-speed rail across this nation, you might have you might take down the amount of truck drivers that are doing long-haul runs, maybe. But as Angela is describing, it's like once you get from the warehouse to where actually the delivery is going, no. That's not, it's just not going to fucking work. Um, and at the end of the day, if those efficiencies were then built in, right? So truck drivers don't have to go so many long distances, right? It's just, I got to spend my day going boom, 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 boom. And, and then I get to be back home. Up. Right. Yeah. It's don't that, decrease their weight. That's, that's think, when you just you know, say, Hey, we've, we've, we've found an efficiency. And so all, all boats get raised, right? All because of the tide is now raised. Um, but that's not how things we have worked in the past and 
would work under the same system. And th- this to me is where, you know, the importance of having, I mean, not that it all comes down to the leadership, but union leaders with a vision, with this kind of vision, because there was actually um, one of the leaders of the amalgamated transit union, Larry Hanley, who recently passed away, but he was someone that had a vision of, you know, uniting with public transit riders and building coalitions with them. And I think he would be the type of person that would see the vision like, they should be on the forefront. They should be preempting this by per saying we have a, a proposal for efficiency that is pro worker, you know, that like Angela said, you, you know, you could make efficiency without decreasing people's wages and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think there's some potential there for transit unions to be involved in like the Green New Deal and things like that. Um, I think it'll be a battleground. Just just recently in Philly, we had um, you know, SEPTA, our transit agency wanted to uh upgrade our trolleys that, that we still use and build a new trolley depot. And uh, Amazon, it looks like it's going to outbid them for an Amazon facility. So like now, instead of not only having the public transit aspect, but, you know, creating more unionized jobs, if Amazon wins out, now you're just creating a warehouse with workers making 15 an hour at most. Uh, but that's a battleground. I think, you know, the left should be fighting on around stuff like that. And I being form, I have to say it. For I served when I was legislative director. Larry Hanley was the international president for uh, uh, the amalgamated. I was Transunion. wondering if you knew him. Yeah, proud member of amalgamate, nice. former member of Amal ATU Local Nine Nine Eight. It got it tattooed on my arm. Um, say what you We <laughs> he fun fact about him really quick because he you know he's transitioned he was watching what was happening with the occupy movement mm. and atu under his leadership was one of the first labor unions to jump in with occupy and right. solidarity and yeah. you know us being part of the wisconsin uprising was a part of that and the shit that mm-hmm. we were stirring up and getting involved in and getting our members involved in so you know, big love, rest in love and power to Larry Hammond. Yeah. They don't make them like that no more. Right. And we, we were probably at the Labor Notes conference together. Did you ever go to those, Angela? In Chicago, yes. Okay, yeah. So that's when I heard Larry Hanley sp- speak. I mean, that's kind of how I know Howie Hawkins too, by the way, with TDU yep, and here. all that stuff. So all your Bad. all your pink all your pink old left is black people. <laughs> 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 well, you don't know about that, Pascal. You nationalist. Yeah, you know, he's everything. You know, know, know that? He's got. He's got. I'm gonna get, get my markers about, about the Captain unions. Captain, Captain Crunch hat. shit right off, and then he just <laughs> Pascal wants to be the new, you know, transit yeah. agency head. He doesn't want to be a union person. Marcus is Marcus Garvis. Garvis's hat is the reason actually that I wanted to like him so much. You know, Captain. I kept like reading in and like, man, like, like he's not a, just, just like, there's got to be some more good there, like something I can hang my hat on. And like, you know, man, it's not. aesthetics you matter. Draw, you aesthetics draw. do matter. I mean, with you me, Phil Randolph, those suits are so sharp, man. The press, man. That's, that's what, uh, that's what got me with a Phil Randolph. But again, that's a great clean. movie. I got to shout out Robert Townsend. I actually tried to send a message to Robert Townsend to come on the show because I, there's a lot of his work that I actually appreciate and Hollywood shuffle is still one of my favorite movies. Yes. And that's, and that's the great quote. There's always work at the post office. There's always work at the post office. It's a very office. political statement. <laughs> or a winky dinky dog. Winky. <laughs> <laughs> we need an Eddie Murphy time. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we, I, I look, genius. look at that, this chat. Pascal wears capri pants and sandals. You ever you know, catch I, that? I'm, I'm getting you? all kinds of grief. Because I said, oh, Paul, are you familiar with the show The Boondocks? Oh, yeah, of course. Just, just so there is a come on, I'm not like 10 years old. Like, come <laughs> on now. <laughs> There's a scene from The Boondocks where Huey Freeman goes back to Chicago, where he's supposed to be from, and a good friend of him is now friends with a Hotep type character mm. that uh, says, Oh, you're the revolutionary human Huey Freeman. Well, where's your poems? Where's your sandals? Where's your capris? <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part about that show was when the white high school teacher kept saying harambe yes oh, oh man that, <laughs> that gets me <laughs> right my right. 
I think my favorite part was when uh, if they had like done the thing of like Mal- uh, Martin Luther King wasn't dead; he was just in a coma. Oh, that pissed a lot of people off. Peabody for that, I believe. They won some sort of award for that. Yeah, a lot of people were pissed off about that. Oh mm-hmm. man, I mean, I think they even talk about him being a socialist, right? Because he goes on like a Bill O'Reilly type Aaron show. Magruder? You know, no, it's funny Martin because Luther. I remember not to date myself because everyone here thinks I'm geriatric. I remember. <laughs> I used to follow the Boondocks uh, strip Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. the cartoon. Y'all don't remember. Mm -hmm. The the comic strip was way more radical than the cartoon, man. And it had better politics, too. Well, that was why Magruder left the show. Uh, MJ is saying it went downhill season three. I believe season three was the year that he leaves. And Comedy Central try, or Adult Swim tries to do it on their own. Hmm. Yeah. They got to keep the cast, but his politics that he fought for. I mean, keep in mind, I, I believe the one episode that they actually wouldn't air was either the Tyler Perry episode or the BET episode. I want to say it was the BET episode where he just goes in on BET to no end. And and like buy I think it's a two or three parter, actually. Well, you know, Viacom owned all that shit. And they were like, no, you're not airing this. So there's a lot of stuff that he had to make, like, significant edits to. And so then he goes off and does that uh, that Black Jesus show, which I also thought was pretty fucking funny. Too. I have a, I have a young uh, socialist uh, Black woman comrade friend. She's young. She's in grad school. She's She tried to debate with me that she said the boondocks is reactionary respectability politics. And it's not good. I was like, Ooh, wow. I was like, she was, she's a little too woke for herself. She was like, it's reactionary, respectability politics, et cetera. I was like, damn, wow. Where's the really? respectability politics in the boondocks? I guess uh, maybe Uncle Russ. I don't know. Uncle Ruckus? Yeah, <laughs> where exactly? I mean, is, is grandpa <laughs> moving to the, to the nice neighborhood? I mean, is that res- a know. pimp like a pimp named Slickback? Nope. <laughs> it's like a tribe called Quest. Just say the whole thing. <laughs> believe it or not i do remember the comic strips in the newspaper i do remember reading those yeah they sound like from the 20s Pete, i'm trying to remember the third season all i remember about that i remember the warner the Herzog. boondocks used to come on the motion picture screen back in my day <laughs> The post office used to deliver it. <laughs> yeah, the milk right after the milkman would come, get the comic strip out. You know, Langston you know Hughes old. wrote a poem about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you know you're old if you remember watching TV before cable. We're old, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I remember select TV while y'all fucking around. Okay, <laughs> that shit yes. that was what circa 1979, 1980. By the way, Angela, I hear that you're a house music fan. Shout out to people who are old enough to remember house music. Thank you very much. I wanted, to, I wanted to wake up early this morning and make a house music beat, but I'm in the middle of doing this music project that I told Pascal about, and it's been just so fucking depressing. Are you talking about my theme song? They don't even know I what house music theme song. is. I didn't know you liked house music, Pascal. Oh, my God. What do you mean? I love house Paradise. I love house music. House is life. I mean, going, being young and going to the the club on somebody else's ID, and that was like the closest I get to like religious experience. Like you, you talking about we love? Yeah, oh, the house. Love. I mean, we, can't, we can't play copyrighted music here, but I was about to send Jason some tracks and be like, hey. oh, it, it's, it's it's frustrating. How did you guys get away with it on Jacobin, Paul? Or did you get someone made that music for you guys? I think someone made that. Yeah. Oh. Okay. No, I, I, I know. Was asking about Frankie Knuckles. No. Wait, Paul, are you admitting that you're just stealing people's labor? Is that what's? Is that what's? <laughs> are we getting a no scoop right here? Jacobin <laughs> is taking artists, artists, uh, labor and stealing it to for their for their YouTube channel. Is that? I think someone made it for us. I, I oh. have no control over the matter. I, mm. I don't know anything. Interesting. Interesting. I'm Interesting. Jacobin. You know who had good intro and break music, but it was copyrighted music. I don't know how he got away with it. it was Michael Brooks. I was like, I was into a show. He had some Wu Tang on there. I was like, how does this happen? No, no, Napoleon the Legend made his his uh... yeah. I was in, oh, I I think for certain for certain songs. You legit. You just if you ask the artist, hey, can I use this song? And they say yes, you're you're good. 
Yeah. Um, uh, That's what I we, think is happening at Jackman. Yeah. Uh, ask well, Kale, Kale Brooks. He's he's the boss. I want to so. look. Uh, next week we have speaking of music, uh, Napoleon the Legend is going to be our guest next week, and I wanted to talk about. Damn, Marcus just right. left. Uh, Marcus, you got like, uh, hip hop no, beat. No, Napoleon, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, no fuck. Fuck that old light skinned nigga in the bald head, hoodie wearing ass nigga. <laughs> Oh, French speaking ass. <laughs> French speaking moving picture ass. Friend, who the fuck you think he is? I think I'm Marcus. Uh, <laughs> Marcus, why you get up and leave like that? You need to say, Marcus. excuse me. You just got up. And, yeah, you got you, up. Like, no no podcast no. etiquette, man. No podcast enough. He uh, was like, y'all was talking. He, hey, he wasn't trying to. He wasn't, wasn't trying to any... fuck. Hey, Marcus, Napoleon the Legend is coming on the show. Yeah, that's what's up. Okay, that's what's up. Kind of, like, fuck him. No, no, I was like, <laughs> hell yeah. And then, you know, my partner needed me, so I... Oh, okay, I got you. I got you. Okay, that's I, wanna... no... I was thinking about uh, shooting him a message um, to see if I could get him on a Tuesday. Well, he um, well, he's, he's, he's in a different country, so the times... The Tuesday actually might work for him because that's earlier. But um, Saturday, he's coming on, and I want to talk about hip-hop and the politics of hip-hop. And what else did you guys want to talk about with a real oh, rap? Wow. Are we going to have the hip? We're going to have uh, This Is Revolution hip-hop conversation with Napoleon? Yeah, but this is Revolution hip-hop conversation. I'm assuming that you young colored folks listen to hip-hop. A little bit. I'm, I'm kind of shaky on Paul. I he think like, he I looks mean, like a pure, pure classical music guy. Oh, that's fucked up. He got a do rag in the back. He had to take down because he right. didn't. Want to <laughs> I love all kinds of music, right? Do you Don't look to... at me like that, Pascal. Do you listen Ooh. to rap at all, Paul? Yeah, yeah. You listen oh, to like I would, young I would love to. I would love to talk to him about the, uh, you know, what we were just even with with athletes about just the whole black business thing. Black business owner, you know, that you know what I'm actually curious is too is that like where and Angela, where you're free to come, if you if you can come back next week, if you're down to come back next week and talk hip hop with us with uh First of all, I really want to say how much I appreciate Angela being on her show. I think she brings a certain balance to all you overly testosterone cho- charged young men. I like her insights, her charm is, is very welcome. I've been saying for a long time we need to have more sisters on this show. Jason's been fighting me tooth and nail on this issue. <laughs> I'm just what, having Angela on the show? Having more or sisters black on the show. No, I'm not <laughs> fighting tooth and nail. Do you know how hard it is to get these young negresses to want to come on the show? Oh, okay. So maybe if you didn't call it's them, so it's their called. fault. So now you're <laughs> putting it on them. Yes, I'm victim. I, uh, I can defend Jason on that because after the after the campaign, I didn't want to talk to nobody about nothing. Yeah. I was like, let me the fuck alone, the whole world. But because Jason is a friend, and because I this is a podcast I love very much and I'm, have the she, utmost every respect. Every time she says that, she makes my heart all like warm and fuzzy, man. That's like wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am a stand. Y'all keep me, y'all keep me company in my truck every week when I'm at work and give me things to yell at the radio and chew on and all this other good stuff. So like I'm not blowing y'all's head up when I say that. I am a I am a stand of this podcast. I get messages about the show that you were on. <clears throat> Angela was on the show, and I like to ask people when I do the audio podcast, because I don't have any comments and it's just me and another person. First of all, I just like to ask people about where they're from. I think where people's origins are very interesting. I've been around a lot of places, and so I, I love to hear about people's backstories. And Angela and I got into a story. She's from Milwaukee. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> we, we we got we got into it about you know Milwaukee and the, and its history and it is a show that's hard for me to listen to because I can't even listen to it without tearing up a little bit. Because it just you gets know, so deep and emotional. Let me tell you something about Milwaukee, right? It wasn't until my adult years that I learned Milwaukee was so racially jacked up. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, this is the, the power of media and propaganda. 
I remember the first time I met a black person from Milwaukee and they schooled me to how bad it was. I was like, damn, I thought Milwaukee was wonderful. I used to watch Happy Days when I was a kid and I was like, I don't know black people happy and I hear that. That is the first thing. First thing people say is, it's black people in Wisconsin? And I'm like, I see Wisconsin. That ought to tell you. You say, yeah, they all in Milwaukee. <laughs> well, to be honest, I mean, Milwaukee, Racine, Kenosha, and the further north you go in the state, we all in prisons. So, I mean, there's that. And, you know, I was liking it. Three black people in Green Bay. Quick when you don't, the powder Nestle quick when you don't mix it up right. Oh, all shit. the black is at the bottom and it get whiter as it go up. That's Wisconsin. God damn. You said when... <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, it's funny. The only uh, people I know from Milwaukee are colored people. We out here, man. Yeah, well, the oh, whites are staying oh, and pushing. Oh. Like that's that's the white people in Milwaukee. That's the goal. The only people leaving is black people. Uh, a friend, a good friend of mine, friend of show, uh, Conan Neutron, actually, Pascal, uh, moved to Milwaukee. Um, and part of the reason why part of it was a job, but another part of it was because uh, he really wanted to get involved in Milwaukee and Wisconsin politics because he felt that that was going to be a center of a lot of uh, important political fights, especially uh, work related, labor related fights. But no, I mean, because the image, because I, I actually applied to University of Wisconsin Law School. I was thinking about going out there, and I, the, the image that they sell is like, oh, it's a progressive kind of like you know the Midwestern white progressive, blah blah blah. And I have a buddy of mine who's a lawyer. He went to Wisconsin. He's from Milwaukee. He was like, yo, man, it's a racist ass town. And I was like, I was like, dude, I lived in Boston. You can't tell me it was as bad as Boston. He starts telling me stories. I was like, Shh, I was like Boston is Shangri-La, man. Damn. <laughs> it's, the most, it's the most segregated city in America, or it was. I don't know if, if another city has taken it over. Um, Milwaukee had a socialist mayor. From Which, this, you know, is going to kind of brings me back to uh uh politics and kind of how people talk to people specifically black people um because that's the thing is that like this is it's still prevalent like and when people talk about or politicians when they start talking about going to the heart of america they're talking about wisconsin but they're not talking about black people you know and we i don't know the people <laughs> <laughs> well, I know uh it maybe touch on that before you go about talking about the heart. Oh, yeah, of... how, like politics just dealing with communities as literally just putting monoliths on communities and it being bullshit. You Y'all know what it history. is. Like and yes, Jeremy, Milwaukee was where the term sewer socialism came from. And we it is a very socialist you know, has a very long socialist history. So you're absolutely right. And when I ran in 2014, I ran for Milwaukee County Sheriff as a socialist, you know, continuing that history. So there's that. Um, But what you were just saying, Marcus, you're absolutely right. And you know what it is. Like when you want to pander to the Midwest, the heart of the country, the breadbasket, the dairy, (laughs) you're not thinking about us, which is why it's always a shock you know, for people like in the South who don't know that um, we up there, they're always surprised to hear, you know, mm-hmm. you're not from Chicago. They get that part. But, you know, when we're talking about the Midwest, we're not talking it, in popular imagery. We're not talking about the cities of the Midwest. We're not talking about the people who are in the industrial centers of the Midwest. They, mm-hmm. this, there's this bucolic, bucolic image that's put out about this wholesome Nordic, you know, pig mm-hmm. farm, whomever. And it's like, nah, bruh. And even, even when they talk about the industrial Midwest, it, you know, for a lot of people, that's like where the whole, that's the white working class is the Midwest not realizing that, you know, so many black workers were in the Midwest, you know, we're, and we're part of those unions that were built out there. Well, we've been going for three hours. This is the free show. So thank you everybody for the super chats. Thank you guys for all tuning in. Thank you, Paul, Angela. Angela, Marcus. you got to come back again. You know, I need you here yeah. to balance out these, these, there's, these there's an open, Angela, there's an open invitation out next week. 
just for shits and giggles, I'll send you the link. Please do, because yeah. if they don't make me work, I'll be here. Next week, I'll put this away. I, I won't have this out next oh, week. You know, you know. No, you better. Oh, do your thing. Be you, do your be thing. You. you know, I get it. Banging is a lifestyle. So, you know. Right. You've got to have the whole ski mask on next time. Right. <laughs> Support you in whatever you do. Just thank you. That's, that's um, speak your truth, King. Speak your truth. Because we right. have to get into to somebody want to know about you running for for sheriff. That's so funny. Man, I look, so that's interesting. A whole she has story. all these great job stories. I like Angela. <laughs> oh my God! I feel like yeah, I gotta go. Yeah. Star on my day. Well, I, tell you, I told you, Angela was was. Uh, I can't curse now. I told you, Hi, she, baby. Yes. What you told me? She like house music. I know she's gonna be cool. I love house music. House music is and shout out to Black Coffee for his newest newest album. Uh, what is it? Uh, subconsciously, it is from top to bottom. It's about y'all want it. Y'all want it. Just came out. All right. So you know. thank you guys very much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Marcus. Of course, thank you to my wonderful, extremely intelligent. Uh, best writer in the world, hmm. Pascal Robert, co host. Thank you, John, for monitoring the chat. Like, mm. Thank you guys for participating in the chat, even when it gets heated. I appreciate y'all. I just want you to know that I, MJ, we're still cool, even though it gets heated, we're still cool. So, all right, and on that note, we are out. <laughs> You are